Hi, I am Mr. Beat. This is another episode of 10 Questions. And if you don't know what that means, like if I'm speaking gibberish to you right now, that just means that we ask each other 10 questions. Who are we? Well, uh, a special guest I have on. And the special guest this time around is Chris from Vlogging Through History. Um, oh, I was supposed to pull up his, his bio and I, I had it all planned out and I forgot to do that. So I'm just going to go off the cuff here. Uh, <laughs> Chris, uh, yeah, I, let's see, I've been following his stuff for a couple years now. Um, let's see, it would have been early, I believe, 2021. And I think the first video I saw of his, he was reacting to one of my um, videos um, because that is kind of the main thing he's known for. He's somebody who knows a lot about history, uh, especially uh, American history, uh, military history, European history, a lot of history. <laughs> and he reacts to history videos out there. Um, but he also makes original content, which a lot of folks don't realize. Um, high quality content. Um, I've gotten to know him ever since reaching out to him first a couple of years ago. Um, and he is here tonight. We're going to ask each other 10 open-ended questions to hopefully lead to a very fruitful and engaging, entertaining conversation for you all to tune into. So uh, please give a warm uh, welcome in the chat to Chris uh, from Vlogging Through History. What's going on, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Hey. Okay. Uh, An audience of one. You're supposed to have five back there, Beavis and Butthead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. Oh man, that's you know that's my, that's my generation too, man. Grew up a Beavis and Butthead. Love those guys. Does everybody know your last name? I was like, I I, I stopped myself. I, I, I've mentioned it enough. It's yeah. So okay. I, it's not it's anything I like hide from anybody. No. Yeah, because some people are weird about that online. Yeah. They want a little yeah. bit of separation. Okay. Or well, whatever you can Google his last name. So yeah, um, if somebody, I, I want you also to introduce yourself because you know I'm sure that was not a good enough job. So like, if somebody is watching right now or listening and they have no idea who you are, how would you explain your YouTube channel <laughs> to them? Yeah, so uh, I started my YouTube channel as the intention was to make uh, historic site content. I was going to visit. I was already doing it at a gaming channel. And I would put little vlogs from history sites when I was there. And eventually I figured out the YouTube algorithm doesn't like it when you do completely weird things like that. So I started vlogging through history to vlog my visits to those sites. Well, right about the time I started the channel was when COVID hit. So I wasn't traveling at all. Yep. Uh, so then somebody suggested I do reaction videos to historic content and just kind of talk about what they get right, what they get wrong, give more details, those kinds of things. And I did that and it took off like insane. like. Start, within the first month, I was getting like a thousand subscribers a day. And I'm like, all right, maybe people like this kind of stuff. Cause I never, never dreamed that's what I'd end up doing. Um, <laughs> so I've, I do a lot of that, but the, the, the passion is the historic site videos and, and I'm starting to do some more original content, even from the studio. Um, but the reaction videos are what make it possible for me to do that other stuff. So I'll, I'll probably always do both. Yeah, no, it, I have videos. I feel almost obligated to make that kind of, you know, that's what people click on. Uh, fortunately, I do enjoy those. But yeah, I feel like anytime I make a president's video, yeah, I'm doing that too. <laughs> like, yeah, I get the, the get people who typically wouldn't watch my stuff, kind of reel them in. But also um, my compared series, because a lot of yeah. times the people who watch my compared videos are people that are from those places I <laughs> talk about. And then there's they kind of some of them stick around, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, this guy, I guess I like him. I guess he's OK. Um, but yeah, like my bread and butter is just political history. I mm -hmm. I love all political history, um, especially at the federal level. But I wish I did more local stuff. Yeah. Uh, OK. Oh, something. I just saw this pop up. This is one. This is related to one of my questions I was going to ask you. Oh, boy. So, um, <laughs> I'll go ahead and put it up here. Um, been, been a big fan of both of you guys for years now. Are you going to debate the Electoral College? Uh, I'm not going to debate him, but we will discuss the Electoral College okay. All right. later Sounds on. Good. I'm not, not going to jump into it right away, though. But thank you. Thank you, Trif, 
Triffy Diffy for that. Uh, oh, creepy PFP, by the way. Uh, oh, and thank you, Kaiser Wilhelm II. Oh, says hi. Yeah, we got the died in 1941. That's right. You know, a lot of time travelers in the comment section. So, yeah, again, we will ask each other questions here. It kind of adds a nice structure, too, because it kind of, we would probably go off on really weird tangents otherwise. Um, kind of real, it kind of keeps us uh, on track. And I always start us off, unless you really want to start us off. No, go for it. I wouldn't be offended if you wanted to. <laughs> okay. And I, I kind of start with the softball here. Um, so it's clear that you are passionate about history. Um, and I just wonder, like, why didn't you study history in college? Like, why didn't you pursue? Because you could have easily got a PhD and like been a professor with your, all right. your passion and knowledge. So I did study history in college. That was my degree. Um, your degree just, was in history? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I majored in history in college. Um, but you didn't do that afterwards. No, no. I ended up going into youth ministry. <laughs> oh, and then I went, back, then I went minor. back to school. To get a degree in pastoral and uh, pa or, and uh, Bible and theology, um, once I had gone into ministry. But um, yeah, I, I, my my intention when I first started my freshman year of college was to be a history professor. That was what I was going to school for, uh, and I actually even I got as far as doing like my student teaching and everything. Uh, and then okay. just uh, I was I was the vice president of Fellowship of Christian Athletes at my school. I had been in high school as well. Uh, and so I started leading Bible studies on Wednesday nights on campus and just really kind of felt pulled in that direction. Uh, but I always had this love for history. And that was why one of the reasons why I started the channel is because my wife and kids were tired of hearing about it. And I had no outlet for it, for history. <laughs> and um, yep. and I was doing a lot of family history and writing family history books and things like that. Uh, but I didn't really have an outlet for it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely did go to school for that. And I have subbed a few times here and there. Um, but no, I never, just never went into teaching and even thought about it a few years ago before this channel took off, thought about going back into it and maybe doing teaching, but then the channel took off. So I didn't need to. It would be okay. Well, somebody said your last name in there. So why not? It would be amazing having Mr. Mowry coming in as a substitute teacher. You would have been the best substitute teacher ever. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I wonder if anybody's watching has ever had you as a, as a sub. Okay. I was a sub too, by the way, when, before I, I taught, I, oh, nice. Cause I, uh, got my teaching license during the great recession. Perfectly mm. timed. Uh, so 2009. Yeah. I was a little earlier than that. Uh, late nineties <laughs> for me. So, <laughs> oh, oh, oh yeah. And I couldn't find a job. Uh, mm. and so I coached tennis, but during the day I would substitute in all kinds of different districts. Uh, so I did that for a full semester and I think it was really good for me. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of forces you to like, learn how to adapt to all kinds of different environments. Um, but yeah, like it makes, I mean, you are a great communicator. That's what we do. We're communicators first and foremost of, um, it's like we have this secret knowledge that we don't own that knowledge. Mm -hmm. and a lot of that we actually don't know. We just kind of discover along the way, just like everybody else. But I always tell people, remind them almost because what we specialize in is like taking that knowledge and making it digestible for the hundred <laughs> percent. That's, that's the thing. Yeah. And I think part of what prepared me for now being in my mid forties doing a YouTube channel is that I have been, even though I haven't worked in a history field, I've been a public speaker all my life, either exactly. as a preacher or speaking for Rachel's challenge, speaking in schools. So I've had all this experience with communicating that prepared me for this and um, make made this an easy transition for me to get in front of a camera and do live streams and make videos and things like that. Absolutely. I say the same thing. I think I said in a previous episode of this, I, before I was a teacher, I was, you know, playing gigs. Um, yep. And uh, you're a musician as well. I did some of that too. Actually, uh, yeah. it was uh, right about the time I started doing YouTube was when I, I had, I was thinking about doing music full time as well. So I was kind of playing with all these different ideas, figuring out where I was going to go and was doing music quite a bit, uh, playing in wineries and coffee houses and things like that a couple nights a week. <laughs> I always like playing at the coffee houses better than the places of alcohol because the people tend to be nicer at the coffee shops. <laughs> That's true. And, and the style of my music is more acoustic. Like I either play piano or just an acoustic guitar. And so it yeah. fits the cafe better than 
a place where a lot of people are drinking and can tend to get rowdy and things like that. They want a little more upbeat than what I can offer. Do you have recorded stuff out there that we can just listen to? Any like there's a few videos on YouTube from about 10 years ago. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, if people search my name, they'll find it. It's there. I can't uh-huh. vouch for the quality of it, but I oh. do um I, I recorded a CD 12 years ago with original music I wrote and then was in the process of doing a second one, never finished it. And um I was raised by my grandparents. My my grand my grandparents were in their 30s when I was born. So I mean they they were my parents. Um, they were young enough to be my parents and they were the only parents I ever had growing up. And, um, but my grandfather did music all his life, had bands, uh, recorded things like that. So he had a recording studio at his house and we recorded everything there. And then he passed away uh, a year ago on the 29th of December. And so I have all of his equipment here now. And so I've got a right off camera here. I've got a recording studio set up now. So uh, my daughter and I are going to start working on some music together. Yeah, that's one of my goals for the new year is to do that more because I, I kind of got out of it once I because, you know, you make videos and um, you kind of itch that scratch with creativity. We all have to be creative in some ways. And so yeah. if you're being creative with the videos, you kind of neglect the other ways to be creative. And I've, I've neglected the music for so long, but at the same time, I still miss it. I mm-hmm. still so that, that's never gone away. A lot of people like who are musicians when they're younger, they're in bands they kind of grow out of it and they're mm-hmm. like, they move on. But I don't think, I just feel like I have all these things that are like, I have so many song ideas on this. Oh, nice. That I'm like, Do you get really song played. ideas in really weird places and awkward times that you can't like, there's no easy way to write them down or record them. And you, oh, thankfully yeah. we have these now that we can do that. Right. You can just <laughs> kind of say it into. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's never, um, it's usually when I'm walking actually yeah because like your mind wanders when you're mine's when i'm laying in bed and i'm half asleep and i don't and like sometimes i'm thinking did i just dream that or you know how did that work out so, interesting yeah when you but it, it, what's nice about music too for folks like us is it's an outlet it's a creative outlet that is not the same as what we do like with yes. youtube right so so it's something different because you know just like anything when you do it as a job as much as this even though this is a job it doesn't feel like one right it's a passion too yeah, it's still nice to do something that isn't connected to all of that. Yeah, and I even have my other style video, my my funny videos. That oh I yeah, make. yeah. And literally, it's like a sense of humor that most people, you know, certain type of people get it. But no, I mean, and we see that in some of your videos too. I mean, you do that at the beginning of some of your videos. You have you kind of display a little bit of your sense of humor. Yeah. I, I, I don't even mean to half the time. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, okay. I think I've, wow, that we're already, we need to get rolling here. This Chris. is, this is how, this is how we roll. We, we did a four hour <laughs> live stream on the president. So, all right. Um, I'm going to give you an easy one to start out then. Um, really simple. Uh, if you could live in another country, where would it be and why? Um, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, I'm, kind of lazy when it comes to like learning a new language so it helps if it's a place that speaks they where they speak english um however like you know i think i can't really i think i'm always going to be drawn towards the united states not just because of family and friends here but um you know it's still my favorite country so Mm -hmm. i know this is a really lame answer but canada (laughs) i know it's a I I, uh, I do like Canada a lot. It's my second favorite country. My third yeah. favorite is Iceland. Oh, um, have you been to Iceland? No, but I I'm one, I'm the type of person if I see an Iceland video recommended to me, I will watch it. Like it's yeah. all just I keep watching. So I know a lot about the country and I uh, just the culture. Really, all Scandinavian countries. Um, I really it seems like they are way more advanced like mm-hmm. in terms of like being more civilized than American society in a weird way. It's like, Oh, that maybe that's what we can aspire to be. Cause like, they're just nicer. Mm-hmm. They're nicer, nicer human beings. And I'm just like, okay, well, uh, something's going right there that they're doing it right somehow. So, and I know there's certain things that we don't want to kind of, that are at odds that maybe of what, what they do and I get it, but at the same time. And, and Canada is kind of a nice balance. Cause like, there's a little bit they're kind of scandinavian but at the same mm-hmm. time they're they're kind of american too they're really yeah. 
like very similar cultures, obviously. So, so you and I were both in the UK at the same time last year. Uh, I think you were up in right. Scotland when I was in London. Yes. Uh, so, so what was that like for you guys? Was there any culture shock? Was there anything you were like, oh, this is really different than how we do things here? Well, I remember you and your family had went there like the previous year or something. Yeah, we went last, uh, a year ago this summer. Yeah. So, but yeah. yeah and so, and I, when we met up in, in Denver, uh, what was it November last year? You were like kind of giving me some pointers and tell me about it. And you were spot on. Like, I think the, I mean, Scotland, we, we really loved in mm -hmm. particular, um, just because of the natural beauty of the place. But um, the problem with London, was the American tourists that were everywhere, <laughs> like just tourists in general. So it felt like you weren't really getting a, a good read. And right. so once we got out of London, we really started to enjoy things more, I think. And the main thing though, is like, man, food was cheaper and better. I bet healthier. I, yeah. <laughs> healthier food, it tastes better. And it, to yeah. me, I, like it was also cheaper because that was at the time when inflation was really getting bad in the United States, but it wasn't, quite as bad I believe, mm -hmm. with food at least other things like uh, gas prices was skyrocketing in, in mm -hmm. UK but not food and so I was like wow all this great food for so cheap and then uh, I think the other thing too is I noticed that being an American like uh, you could kind of see a little bit of bias against you a little bit in certain mm -hmm. parts like not London mm -hmm. but yeah like once we there were we've tried to like we rented a car uh, we were kind of crazy. I was, I got used to driving <laughs> on the wrong side of the road. Yeah. Uh, the guy that checked out the, the car to me had watched my channel before. So that was a, surreal, but nice in, in Edinburgh, Scotland. But yeah. Uh, and so we really got off the beaten path. And I think some of the, uh, the more rural folks, they tended to be more prejudiced against Americans. Hmm. Kinda, I don't know where that came from, but I'm not going to speculate too much, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, what's your, like, same question to you real quick. Yeah. yeah. What, what's your favorite country um, outside of the, it's related to one of my questions. I Yeah. Have. So, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been to Europe several times in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, so I would say Scotland for me and, and my kids as well. My kids are dying to go back to Scotland. They, they like, ah. you know, you know how it is when you travel with your family after a week or two, everybody's ready to be home and away from each other. Oh yeah. The one time that didn't happen was when we went to Scotland, we, we, cause we went to the UK for two weeks. We were a week in England and a week in Scotland. That's pretty much and what I, we did. We, yeah. We were worried it was going to be too long and we were worried by the end of oh, it, no. it was going to be so rough. Much. We got to the end of that second week. We were in Scotland and we were plotting for ways to stay longer. That's how much everybody was enjoying Scotland. Uh, yeah. So I would, we would love to go back there. I, I think if I were to live somewhere, it would be that on the mainland of Europe of the countries I've been to so far, I would say Austria. I really liked Austria mm. a lot. The food was the best I've had in Europe anywhere. Uh, the people were great. And of course, especially when you're in restaurants and hotels and anywhere in the service industry, pretty much everybody speaks English in Europe anyway. Yeah. Um, I've only encountered a very small number of people that didn't speak English when I've been in Europe. Um, We're so and, and I've tried to speak, like I tried to speak German and cause I know some <laughs> German, I know some French, but they would always just like their English was always better than my German, my French. So they just would default to do you speak English. And then we would speak English after that. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. The the food's healthier. There's a reason you don't see nearly as many fat people in Europe as you do here. <laughs> uh, portion sizes are smaller, all that sort of stuff. I, I think it's it's so important if you're able to, and I realize not everybody can, to get outside of your own culture and experience it just to realize that not everybody does things the way we do. Not everybody thinks the way we do. And it's OK yeah. to learn how other people do things and think, man, that's a way better way of doing that than I would ever have thought of myself. So I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> my question actually was I got a related question. So nice mm -hmm. segue. My second question for you. Is the yeah, like so I know you travel a lot, both for um, your other job mm -hmm. Um, which I assume you don't do as much as you used to, right? No, no, I don't. Yeah, yeah. just uh, not because I, I mean, I could if I wanted to, but I just don't have the time. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I do keep up with your escapades as much as I can. And one in particular, yeah, when you were, when you went to Germany, that's another country that I'm always fascinated with. Mm -hmm. And uh, you did one of those group things, right? Yes. I just want to ask you, like, 
be honest, how, because I, I watched your video where you kind of like, oh, almost like a recruitment video. Yeah. But I want to hear the other side of it. Like, what was, was there anything that kind of surprised you about that experience that was good or bad? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> first of all, um, like, if you were to ask people who know me really well, they would say, you know what? I'm surprised you did that, Chris, because I am by nature as outgoing as I am. I'm an introvert. I prefer to travel alone. Absolutely. I would rather spend a week in Europe and never contact another person while I'm there than be on a group trip with 24 other people. Uh, so I knew it was going to get me out of my comfort zone a little bit. Uh, but every time I've done like a meetup, like, you know, I went to the Shiloh battlefield last year and, Told mm -hmm. people, hey, if you want to show up noon on Friday, I'll be there. And I had like 20 people show up and people drove 10 hours to get there for it just to spend a couple hours walking the battlefield. Every time I've done one of those, it's been a fantastic experience. And so I wasn't sure how it would go. Uh, and I've got another one coming up in Italy in April, but it was actually awesome. Uh, after a week together with those folks. And, and the nice thing about it was it wasn't all 24 of us together for 12 hours a day. Oh, like okay. we would be together for a few hours, do some group stuff, but then you could break off and do your own thing. And I might be with six or eight people for the next couple of hours and things like that. Yeah, uh, so it was broke up real nice, but it was an amazing way to experience things. Um, a bunch of us would even after the tour was over for the day at four or five o'clock, we'd go to dinner and then we'd go find a pub or something to hang out for a few hours. And we'd be out till 12 or one o'clock. I've got like, I think five people now that were on the Germany, Austria trip that are going with me to Italy now as well. Cause they enjoyed it so much. So we've got this whole group that I'm friends with now. And we had built it up a lot over time. Cause we did like a zoom call together. So we all got to know each other a little bit beforehand. And, uh, honestly, those folks are lifelong friends now. Uh, they really are. Awesome. It, was, it was a really cool experience. And I'm, I'm Facebook friends with a bunch of them now. And we talk all the time and we have a, uh, Telegram, the Telegram app. We have a group chat for everybody that was on that tour that we used while we were there. And we're still talking to each other even now on that. So it was actually a really great experience. And uh, I'm probably going to do a few more this coming year. I'm just working on schedule and, and where to go and things like that. So. So was it a lot of work for you to do that? Because I was. I'm it actually was not. Uh, so basically, this company Trove a Trip, and I know like cynical they reached historians. Out to me before, but we never we didn't respond to them. Yeah. So I know cynical historians doing one, and oh, history right, goes yeah. is doing one, and a few others. Um, but um, so they reached out to me. They told me how it worked. They had me put out a survey to everybody that they filled out, and they the people filled out the survey to say like what their budget would be, what time of year they would go and where they would want to go. And Germany was like right at the top of the list. So we picked that as our first trip. I made it available to patrons and members first and 18 of the 24 slots sold out to our patrons and members. Ah. And as soon as it went live for everybody within three hours, it was sold out. Um, awesome. So, yeah, so I, I did very little work. I helped kind of craft the itinerary which they have a preset itinerary and then I could change things. So like they had a sound of music tour in Salzburg and I had them take that out and we put Hitler's Eagle's nest in instead for that, oh, wow. um, which yeah. was really cool. Um, and, and so just little things like that. But then otherwise I just showed up and hung out with everybody. They booked the hotels, the travel, um, they scheduled like some of the meals for us. All we had to do was show up. And uh, we had a guy who was with us named Sammy, who was yep. Belgian who kind of handled all the details and would give us suggestions on where to go to eat and took it's us around like, and showed us. It it's was like great. Those student tours that I used to do with, I did EF, EF tours and, and my daughter's doing one in, in the spring. It's a very similar thing. Yeah. They, they just kind of handle all the crap. That's not very fun to, as far as planning and facilitating the trip. Yeah. So, so it, I mean, it was a little on the expensive side for folks for a week in Europe. Plus you had to pay your, you know, your flight. Uh, so that part I was a little hesitant about because I hate asking people yeah. to pay that much, but it sold out quick and people had put that was their budget anyway. Um, Cause I could probably, if I did it all myself could do it cheaper, but it would be so much work that I don't think I'd do it if it was under those circumstances. So, and we, I mean, we were, I think we've sold 22 of the 24 spots for the Italy tour. So I've never been to Italy. So I'm excited about that one. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, my turn. Yep. Let me pull up my list here. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to ask this question like I was uh, interviewing you for a job, okay? Um, <laughs> as a YouTube content creator, 
What are your biggest strengths and weaknesses? Oh, I like that question. <clears throat> I, th I think uh, as far as, uh, I guess I'll start positive. Um, well, I'm just awesome. <laughs> no. uh, I think, uh, no, I mean, I, I taught in the classroom for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And so I think that has helped me as far as learning how to break down complex concepts and historical events to, you know, if you can teach a seventh grader or something, a complex uh, event, then you can teach anybody, mm -hmm. as they say. Um, and then, you know, like I also... Before I was a teacher, I was in broadcasting. I was in radio mm -hmm. and TV. And so I got good at editing video as far as like telling a story. Um, I think a lot of it is writing, though, honestly. Like mm -hmm. I was always yeah. really good at with um, uh, in ELA class, <laughs> even though I didn't necessarily like literature that much, most literature. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, all those skills, I think I still I'm pretty... I'm all right with, um, but yeah, as far as what I need to work on is weaknesses. Um, I, I kind of have a slower pace style. Um, I even speak slow. I'm like I have people that watch me all the time. They say, I got to watch you at 1.5 speed. Because <laughs> you just, you just be, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, and I think part of my, yeah, I, I think, the dad jokes, I think some of the sense of humor stuff is actually a turnoff for a lot of people. And um, I can sometimes be in like the JFK assassination video did really well. But at the same time, like I had people complaining that, it, you know, even though 60 years has, have passed, it's 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 uh, insensitive to make any kind of joke about mm -hmm. such a serious event. And and so maybe I could be uh, more cognizant of that type of stuff. <laughs> Um, and honestly, that's the thing. Like I, uh, I think the flaws I have with my videos are like my flaws of my personality. Mm. <laughs> it's like who I am as a person. Yeah. It's like, yeah, sometimes I, I'm, I, I'm not very observant. So like when the, when like the audience doesn't like something, I'm slow to like re, oh, they don't, I need to stop mm -hmm. doing that. Cause like for a while there, I would randomly have this, um, orange character in my compared videos um and he was just there for me to like kind of bounce off of a little bit but they didn't really like that orange character and i got rid of him and they didn't miss him so i, I was slow to realize that you know it's my mm -hmm. ego it's my freaking ego <laughs> yeah what a great question that's a, something that uh it kind of you just forced me to reflect about my channel <laughs> <laughs> What am I doing wrong? Do you get certain, are there cer certain things like other than what you mentioned already? I mean, that people comment a lot about in the videos, like your appearance or mannerisms or anything like that. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I've always had struggled with my, my skin acne. Mm -hmm. I've always had, adult, I've had adult acne. Um, people don't even know that's a thing. Like, oh, oh yeah. You, I, when you're a teenager, yeah. you can see the scars for me too. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. He can relate then. Um, yeah. Then like I'm always have like oily skin because of that. It's related, yeah. and so people are like, so they're always commenting on that. Um, I mean, they talk about my nose all the time. People <laughs> say rotten things. Like the thing is, I understand why so many YouTubers never go on camera, especially and female second, YouTubers. I've talked well, to a yeah. lot of female like yeah. people in history in history, and they say three fourths of their comments are about their appearance. Like nobody will take what they're saying seriously because they focus on their appearance so much. It's sad. It's messed up. Uh, yeah. So I, yeah, we, I guess we should be lucky. We should feel lucky <laughs> because yeah, it could be so much worse um, if we were female. Um, but yeah, like I think my other channel, the beat goes on, I'm off camera. And that's one of the reasons because I was just tired of people talking about mm -hmm. how I looked and, um, but there's a certain point though, where I just don't care, you know, you, the older, by the time we're in our forties now, we, we're, we're kind of, we don't really get embarrassed easily. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you, you kind of have to in YouTube, uh, I've talked yeah. about that and other people have asked me that question. I mean, you, you have to have a thick skin. You have to be able to let stuff roll off or else it would get to you really fast. Oh yeah. And I know we, we have our, our, uh, kids have had, they have YouTube channels and you yeah. kind of have to put a wall up from the comment yeah. section, that social media aspect of it. And yep. it's like, don't even look at those comments that, or turn them off. 
turn mm-hmm. them off completely because like that will wreck you if you're a oh, teenager yeah. like as far as yourself you haven't you formed know. your identity of yourself yet and right oh, yeah, yeah. we we did this we were well uh i i was a. Uh, let's see well, I'll just put it this way. I became a full-time YouTuber at the age of uh, 39 years old, you know, so that mm-hmm. there, there you go. <laughs> uh, hey, speaking of full-time YouTubers here, we've got, I think he's full-time, History Underground. He's still teaching for now oh, anyway. He yeah, he teaches in Missouri. Uh, he's in Missouri? Think, yeah, he's in Missouri. History Underground, we need to meet up in, in real life. We're not that far away. Holy crap. And so is Emperor Tiger Star. He's in Missouri. Oh, is he? I didn't know that. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the uh, super chat. Appreciate it. And I know that. Mr. Terry was here earlier because he offered to he offered to uh, to to mediate the oh there it is. Yeah. To mediate a debate of the Electoral College. There Good to see you, Mr. Terry. Yeah, you'll be on a future episode of this, don't you worry. We <laughs> Uh, Indu, thank you so much. Uh, opinions on Laura Kelly. Oh, she's, yeah, the governor of. Yeah, Canada. that's yours. I don't really know much about her. <laughs> she's a Democrat, yeah. isn't she? Yes, she's yeah. a Democrat. Uh, Which she, I always thought came to me anyway, from the outside looking in, I was like, wow, Kansas elected a Democratic governor. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's not actually unheard of. We are, are a more moderate state than mm-hmm. folks realize, and she's definitely a moderate Democrat, mm-hmm. whatever that means. But I think. Um, the main thing is like, she's moderate when it comes to economic policy. Oh yeah. In fact, she put, she, one of her big things has been pushing for lower taxes, uh, particularly like no tax on food and like pretty much everybody agrees with that one. So yeah. it's like, it hmm. seems like, and I don't know if you, you, you know, you cover this stuff more than I do. It seems like when we talk about moderates or for example, someone from a party that doesn't normally win a state like a Republican becoming governor of Massachusetts or Maryland, for example. Yeah. It seems like when the Democrats are moderate, it's they're moderate on economic issues, but they're still fairly liberal on social issues. Yeah. When the Republicans are moderate. It's because they're moderate on social issues, but they're still fairly conservative <laughs> on economic issues. That's definitely, that's very common. Actually, not a lot of people bring that up. That's a good point. I never really thought about it too deeply. But I, I do know, like I know uh, on Twitter, you were you uh, were surprised when I said that Joe Manchin was not a moderate. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. So and what I meant by that was like, I think what's weird is that there's also issues and the issue. I, specifically, I was I have issue with Man- Joe Manchin. If you don't know who that is, he's the senator for West Virginia who's retiring, who's some think he's going to run for president mm-hmm. on a third party ticket. Um, but yeah, J- um, Joe Manchin's like the epitome of what's wrong with um, corporate welfare. And I did a whole video on it. And I was like, the thing is, corporate welfare is one of those I- issues that everybody agrees on, but they don't know they agree on it. Uh, it yeah. is so mind blowing to me. It's like, because like they did, even like the Republican Party, you know, they call it crony capitalism is usually what they call it. And then Democrats usually call it corporate welfare. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing. Yeah. But it's just a different message. And to me, like, oh, wow, that's like. <laughs> That's a that's genius for those who want to keep the system in place. Yeah, and it's unfortunate. Like in Joe Manchin's case, obviously he's going to be a big proponent of anything to do with coal coming from West Virginia. And yeah. at least what I've seen is that, uh, unfortunately, we've created a system where we reward politicians who bring money home. Yeah, uh, and you know, I know, yeah. you know I, I've you know, my two congressmen for almost my entire life were Jim Traffickant and Tim Ryan. Oh yeah, um, that's right. That's yeah, right. And, uh, and and all they ever talked about with those guys was how much federal money they brought home to our district. That was the main criteria for whether you did a good job as a congressman. Did you save our air base, the Youngstown Air Base? Did you get money for investing? You know, how much federal money did you bring home? That's the only thing anybody cared about. It seems. So unfortunately, that's what we've rewarded. And that's the only thing they pass anymore because of the filibuster. All they pass in the Senate are these giant omnibus bills yep. and that, that have something for everyone, little, little rewards, little treats yep. for every state. And that's how, yeah, it's, it kind of makes it even worse for everyone. Anyway, uh, we'll get back on track here. <laughs> We're doing it again. Uh, more super chats. Thank you so much. Kaiser Wilhelm again. Um, Mr. Nixon. You're not familiar. Okay. So, 
Too I bad. did a video a year or so ago <laughs> where I looked online to see what people said about me on the internet. Oh, and there was a, a <laughs> top 10 best channels about Indian history, the history of India. Oh. And I was, it said vlogging through history is a YouTuber named Sam Nixon who does a lot of videos about Indian history, which I hadn't done any at that point. And so it's a running inside joke that I'm Sam Nixon, famous Indian YouTuber. But it had your picture up next to the everything. Name. And it said I was a YouTuber <laughs> about it. Yeah, it was funny. That's awesome. Thank you, Briggs. I uh, should have you on here as well. All my comments are about my age, like they're going to be. Yeah, he's uh, he's like our age. Come on, is you're not really? old. Br I, I don't know how old he is. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, me and my mom love you guys. Uh, what's your all's favorite historical figure? Oh, uh, yeah. Do you want to go first? Go ahead. Start talking. I'm going to go grab mine. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, uh, as far as um, American, well, I don't have a prop. I I think I'm, and it's, I've been intimidated to make a video, um, but um, there's really two that stick out to me. Um, Martin Luther King Jr., mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Harriet Tubman. Oh uh, yeah. And I could Did you see on. the movie about her? Yeah, I think I talked to you about this. I was yeah. just disappointed in it because I felt like it didn't do her justice. In fact, like they left out stuff that was incredible that would have made the movie so much mm. better. For some reason, they left out cool stuff that she did. So yeah. I, and I don't know. It just seemed a little bit uh, slow. And but yeah, I, I I will eventually make a video about both Harriet Tubman and um, nice. Martin Luther King Jr. I want to visit these sites where they actually um, did did their thing, and that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why I haven't made. I want to do them justice, uh, like truly put a lot of effort into the videos. Um, I found like when I made my the, the videos about Dwight Eisenhower and um, George Washington, um, I was like, oh yeah, going to these presidential museums like. Why, why didn't I do this before? Yeah, because I, I had president videos before. Like I had one about James Polk and one about Franklin Pierce. And it's like, man, it makes it so much better when you go there and you're interviewing folks. Anyway, who are, who are yours? Who's your? Oh, yeah. You've really? got the same one in the background there. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we, the exact same one here. How about that? Was, yeah, someone sent that to me. So <laughs> there we go. We've got our, our uh, that. Theodore Roosevelt bobblehead twins there. <laughs> Uh, I just, not only because he obviously was a very consequential figure in American history, uh, you know, I mean, major shift in just America, what, what America looked like and, and all those sorts of things when he was president, but also just his personal life is just really fascinating to me and the things oh, he yeah. overcame and what he experienced and uh, coming from a very, like, privileged and wealthy background and yet considering himself a champion of the common man and all those sorts of things just uh just makes him a really fascinating figure and he's one of those few peoples that people that democrats and republicans today can both agree on that they like i mean it seems like everybody likes theodore roosevelt um, yes, I, yeah I, I'm, I'm waiting for a really good movie to do him justice supposedly uh leonardo dicaprio is going to be playing him in a scorsese movie coming out but we'll see Oh, please, Scorsese, stay alive for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, man, that would be amazing. I didn't even know about that. And also, the thing I love about Teddy is, I have said this before, but like, he just, he continued to get better till the day he died. He continued, he was always curious. Mm -hmm. and he, he changed his mind on a lot of things. And like, yeah. he, he just like, oh, he admitted when he was wrong. And uh because you know he, as a younger man, he had some views that were not so progressive. Yeah, <laughs> they were actually like, oh, kind of racist, there, buddy. It's kind of <laughs> interesting racist. when you look at his life and say a guy like Andrew Jackson. Early in life, you could see a lot of parallels in the way their lives were going in some ways, but went very different directions as they got older. Um, Jackson kind of dug in his heels. Yeah, and, and, and he was more open. Roosevelt very much adapted and. Like you mm -hmm. said, continued to learn, never considered himself to have arrived and and never got to the place where he I mean, there were certain things he was stubborn about to the end of his life. But yeah, a lot of things he was willing to be. I mean, his stubbornness brought us Woodrow Wilson. But, you know, that's another story. Oh, gosh, That was one of his big mistakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, 
Okay, a couple more Super Chats. Man, thank you, guys. I didn't realize I had all these. Uh, question is, a bit late, Mr. BDF plans for a War of 1812 video and VTH. Do you know if you're going to visit Mackinac Island and other related places? Uh, I have already contributed to a War of 1812 video. Actually, I have a couple videos that are kind of about it, but I, I wrote the script for uh, the War of 1812 uh, Battle of New Orleans video um, for Kings and Generals, so that's something. Mm -hmm. Nice. As far as just like a full-fledged video, I don't have any plans, but I definitely would like to do that eventually at some point. And then you? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm actually, I, it's funny, I was I was looking for it now because I actually just got an email today from somebody I've been talking to. Um, I am going to be doing some War of 1812 stuff because I'm going to be speaking for the anniversary of a War, War of 1812 battle up on Lake Erie, up near Sandusky, Ohio. Holy um, crap. Uh, and uh, I've invited to speak, I think around Memorial day. So I'll probably do like I did with my 1776 video and whatever I topic I write about, I'll probably do a video about it too. So, uh, and Mackinac Island, uh, if I ever have a reason to get up to Northern Michigan, I definitely will. That was the, uh, that's a, the, the Northern panhandle of Michigan is the part that Michigan got as a reward for letting us have Toledo. So <laughs> us as in Ohio. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and thank you, Isaac. Uh, glad you're here live, and thank you for the super chat. Okay, we're moving on to the third question, and I think it's my turn. Yes. yes. Okay. So I don't know if he's still here or not, uh, but uh, History Underground tweeted this the other day uh, and inst on, on Instagram, and that was pretty eye-opening, but it was uh, basically an article about how Holocaust denial... Uh, mm. Oh crap! I just age restricted this video by saying the word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but Holocaust denial apparently um, is on the rise. Mm. Um, I mean, there's a, there's other articles I've seen, but it just on overall, there's just a general more ignorance. I think now mm -hmm. about the Holocaust compared to when we were younger. Like, yeah, I know we we spent a lot of time in my um, world history and and American history class learning about it. So my question to you. Um, why is this happening and what can we do to stop it? So part of me thinks we, we seem to be living in a world today where there's a percentage of our population that is increasingly automatically opposed to anything they view as being the, uh, the, the standard view on something. Um, I don't, I'm trying to find the way I want to word this, but basically, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the mainstream view. Therefore, you know, if everybody thinks that they're automatically against it, um, and, and we've seen that, I mean, I don't want to say it has started happening more with Trump in office, but it did seem to escalate and I don't want to blame him for that. I think he was, a, a, a symptom of a problem that was already there, not necessarily the cause of it. Um, but there seems to be a percentage of the population that is automatically, if you say this is what mainstream history says happened, that means it didn't happen that way. And so if everybody says the Holocaust happened, then it probably didn't happen. Um, and unfortunately, I will say, I don't think it's happening as much in places like Germany. When I was in Germany, we went to Dachau. It's my first time visiting a concentration camp. It wasn't a death camp. It was a camp for political prisoners, things like that. Um, but there were a lot of deaths there. Um, and there were dozens of school groups that were there. Uh, it seems like, at least from what I could see, Germany's doing a fantastic job of making sure these kids experience it firsthand in that way. So I don't know if here in the U.S., because we're so far removed from it, not only in time, but in terms of that didn't happen here. It happened somewhere else. It's only something we see pictures of and pictures can be doctored and and information can, you know. But, yeah, I've seen it a lot lately. And it doesn't help that YouTube very often age restricts videos about the Holocaust. <laughs> and it makes it challenging because it makes it much less, much less likely that you and I are going to make videos about that topic that we need to make videos about because we're going to have to fight YouTube just to get people to even see it in the first place. Right. And when you pay your bills with with that. <laughs> Unfortunately, you have to make videos that are going to pay the bills. So, yeah. yeah, you have to. I have literally 
put, I've done what you just said. I put off making videos because I knew that they'd probably get age restricted. And also, I think the last video that I got age restricted was my JFK assassination video. And mm -hmm. it was, I was like, uh, literally 60 minutes did the same. They, they, they showed the photo um, of that I couldn't show in my video. They got it age restricted. It was the photo of uh, Jack Ruby shooting mm, um, yep. Lee Harvey Oswald. Just the photo, not the footage, just the photo. And I ended up, ended up having to blur the whole thing out. Yep. And uh, I, 60 Minutes didn't have to do that. Their video was not age restricted. Um, and there was other news outlets, the same thing. They showed the picture. And so we know that it's a policy that's not universal. It's arbitrary. It's human beings often that are, it's not even bots. Because mm -hmm. I've gotten human beings to go in and check it. Yep. And they're still doing the same thing. But like two different people will. So one person said it was okay. The other person not. I went back and forth with YouTube for a lot. I mean, I mm -hmm. had the luxury and um, to do that. But it, it was so frustrating. And with the Holocaust, you, like shout out to um, the casual historian always for everything he has gone through, poor Grant. He does. He He's not afraid to take on any topic, is he? I mean, he'll go well, after it. More than anyone in, in the history tuber community, Grant has been an ambassador for the Jewish people. Yeah. Telling the truth about Jewish history and mm -hmm. in particular with these genocides. I keep saying words that are... <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And he, time and time again, he is like, he's had several videos get age restricted and mm -hmm. because of that, they're not seen and oh, it's frustrating. It gets old. Yeah. And, I, but I think, yeah, the Holocaust, uh, slavery, slavery's connection to the American civil war, all those kinds of things. It seems like there's this, this growing, it tends to be younger people, but there's older people too, that they're just automatically going to kick back against anything they see as the mainstream view on things. And it's, it can be frustrating. That's why the lost cause myth was so appealing for, and it still is. Yep. So, it seems yeah. To be making a comeback. Contrarian. It goes in waves. Yeah. yeah. All right. What you got next? All right. Uh, let's see here. All right. So I talk a lot about um, on my channel. I love to talk about historical movies and things like that. What is a movie that you have seen that is terrible history, but you love it anyway? <laughs> I still haven't seen the Napoleon film. Actually, I feel embarrassed to say I, I don't watch movies in theaters very often. Um, the last movie I watched in a theater was a documentary about um, about a made for TV movie called the day after. Have you heard of oh, it? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it, that was so good. And it, but it, yeah, like, uh, it's about nuclear bombs being dropped in the United States in particular, specifically Kansas city. And then it was filmed in Lawrence where I live. So yeah. Anyway, uh, I, all, I mean, every, every history movie I've seen, I've had issues with. Um, but honestly, I don't really let it get to me so yeah. much. I'm kind of, I, I heard um, a tune shy and I had this conversation when we did this and he, and he's kind of the same way. He's like, he realizes like, you know, if you, it, it's at the end of the day, it's just, it's, and it's art, you know, yeah. and even what we do a lot of times it's, it's an art form. We don't think of it as an art form. We think of it as purely educational, but it's an art form. It really is. And, um, so the I think the thing that I where I do swing over to the side of like uh, maybe cynical historian or someone who's a little bit more critical is like oh this is is that yeah a lot of people get their history from movies that's true so, yeah um so all of them really I've seen I have there's a few exceptions I think I, I do think Lincoln was they tried really hard to get it right mm -hmm. the, the movie Lincoln um uh, let's see uh, um. Oh, I, I think one that was kind of bad was that I still liked anyway was um, Gettysburg. Do you remember uh, the, the, the the one that came out? In oh yeah, the, I was uh, in Gettysburg when they were filming that movie. When holy crap! Film. Yeah, I met Martin Sheen. Oh wow! He was what staying a, in the same hotel that I was in. So yeah, I can't imagine like that. Probably even further like made you more into. History. It was right at the time when I was really like becoming passionate about Civil War history. I was yeah twelve, thirteen years old. So yeah, it was pretty cool. Wow. So they filmed it like they filmed it 
not, not right on the battlefield, but very near, near to the battlefield. Yeah. Okay, because they couldn't on the actual right, yeah because of the monuments and everything. And, yeah. You, see, I'm a little jealous of you because you live so close to all those sites over there. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, that's cool though. What about you though? What movie for, for me? The one that always jumps out at me that I always really enjoy the movie, but it's terrible history is Braveheart. Braveheart. Oh, yeah. So many things. That's a good example. Wrong, but it's a super entertaining movie. So. And you being a fan of Scotland. Yeah, oh, yeah, and loving Scotland, yeah. Same thing. Oh, speaking of which, my video comparing England and Scotland is finally, as it turns out, coincidence, coming out Friday. So oh, nice. I'm looking for Yeah, I'll, I'll probably have to do a reaction to that one at some point. <laughs> Give it a few weeks to cook first, and then I'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. All right, your turn, unless you got any super chats. Actually, I do. Well, you guys are so nice. Why? Okay. It's, it's kind of nice to break these apart. Oh, oh wow. Look at this. Any, view, uh, any views <laughs> Any views on Euro-federalism? I'm a member of Volt. I don't know what Volt is. I don't either. Euro so I, do admit, and I, I try to keep up on things in Europe, but no. Sorry, I, mean, I don't either. I think we're both fans of federalism in the United States, yeah, though, yeah. As, it, as it is here. If you, if that, I'm, not, I'm not sure what model you're... I, I guess Euro federalism. I don't even know what that means. But, I wonder uh, if it has has something to do with like the EU and that sort of thing. Um, let's see. Oh, like maybe uh, so strengthening the EU or weakening. Yeah. So Volt EU. Europa is a pro-European European Federalist political party. Um, it, it has to do with the EU strengthening the European Parliament. Yeah. So it's. I think it's the idea of a stronger political connection oh. to the European nations. I think honestly it would help them in the long run because they're gonna they're gonna need all the help they can get. Um, it, people don't think about population shifts like mm. um, eventually a lot of Afri African countries and Asian countries are going to be the same level as. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a whole book about it. Uh, I have back here the it's called the flattening of um, like eventually the technology will be even around the world. You won't see the wealth current trends go the way they do. And then after a certain point, the, the countries that will be losing out the most is, uh, the countries that are not growing in population because they don't, they won't have the human capital anymore. Mm, yeah. And so without the human capital, they won't be able to progress as fast. And these other countries will just take their place. And so don't just assume that we always assume the United States will be the top superpower for the next millennia. Heck History no. tells us that doesn't happen. So it does yeah. not happen. <laughs> and who was the world's police uh, even 150 years ago? It was the British. Yep. They were the world's police. Now yep. it's the United. I mean, it, that, that's not that long ago. Uh, I already checked. Okay, what's your opinion on the series Drunk History? Uh, it's funny. It's funny. <laughs> it's funny as long as people realize that half of what they're saying isn't actually true. <laughs> Very inaccurate. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes they're spot on with what they're saying. Other times they're completely off base. So you just have to understand <laughs> that you're getting a mix there. But it is, yeah. it is entertaining. Uh, and then Richard Nixon will just take this one. Um, what's your opinions on Richard Nixon? Uh, I guess in like. 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, his own worst enemy. I think he could have gone down as one of our great presidents if he had. Yeah. If he had not been his own worst enemy. I agree with that. And the older I've gotten, the more I realized there was a lot of. A lot I could relate to with him and I understand his mentality. Um, I never thought I'd say that. Even <laughs> 10 years ago. Yeah. Like. So I think I think as time goes on, he will be viewed more favorably than than he was in the immediate aftermath. He's one of those presidencies that I think will age better with time um, as people focus less and less on the Watergate and the corruption and more on some of the other stuff. So well, especially yeah. when we had Trump come in recent years, Trump has really changed my perspective on all the presidents. Oh, my gosh. That's so true. Yeah. I just watched a video about uh, it was a video of George W. Bush um speaking i don't know how it showed up in my timeline today but it was the day after barack obama was elected and it was bush at the white house 
oh, congratulating yeah. him and talking about and all these people on there who were saying, I hated Bush when he was president. But man, now in the aftermath, I look back and he was such a statesman. <laughs> People's perspectives have changed dramatically on things like that. Still technically a war criminal, but I'm yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, like he was a good guy. I think the thing is that that term I'm going to make a video about this, actually, but like how that that phrase is often um, thrown at um, world leaders, war criminal, when I think that's an oversimplification. I think mm. it's, it does more harm than good to have these labels, because when you're in a, in a position of power like that, um, it's not like you're, you know, that's what you envision is going to happen. When you make a decision, you're not you're not often anticipating, oh, a million people are going to die by me making this one decision. Yeah. I'm sure. That, I mean, that was... Honestly, if we apply that label, any president who has overseen a, a time of war in the last 150 years of American history would be a war criminal. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, we firebombed German and Japanese cities yep. intentionally targeting civilian areas. If that's not, being a war criminal, I don't know how you could label George W. Bush that way and not somebody like Franklin Roosevelt or Harry Truman or Richard Nixon or Lyndon Johnson. Or, and that's why yeah. Calvin Coolidge was so great. Because he was <laughs> not a war criminal. Good job, Calvin Coolidge. Okay. Uh, back to uh, my next question. How do we transition from this? Okay. <laughs> uh, I do have some heavier questions in here. Okay. Like, um. I think I'll save the electoral college for towards the end. <laughs> um, okay, what's they they say they they which you know some people say the fastest way to learn everything is to learn history to study history you know be a generalist it's kind of a shortcut. Mm -hmm. um, I tweeted one time the fastest way to learn history or yeah, sure. The fastest way to learn everything is to study history, but I think the fastest way to learn history is to study economics. Hmm. Do you agree with that? That why or why not? Interesting. I, uh, and you're, you're talking to somebody here who is not nearly as into economics as you are. I know that's <laughs> something, uh, if there's one thing that's definitely true about our channels, uh, you are much more focused on economics and politics and I'm more, focused on wars and things like that. Um, and so we definitely have a different interest in that way. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I don't feel like I'm speaking to this from someone who's in a position of authority to say, uh, but you abs I absolutely agree with the, the argument that everything can be understood through economics. I mean, if you look at any point, mm -hmm. let's just take American history, anything that's happened in American history you can look at it through the lens of economics and understand why people took the positions they did. Slavery, for example. Slavery was a moral issue, absolutely, but it was 100% an economic issue as well. <laughs> and it drove so much of economic policy in North and South. Um, the American Revolution. We talk about taxation without rep representation, but there were a lot of other economic factors involved. And there was issues of wanting to settle land west of the Appalachian Mountains and, and the economic growth that could come with that and the wealth that people saw that was possible if the United States got its independence. And uh, So yeah, I would agree that economics is a fantastic way to understand any historical topic. Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's some truth to that. Thank you. I feel a little uh, vindicated. I, I I think it's harder for people because I think a lot of people don't understand economics. Yes, so, that's it. And so is people it. don't want to touch it because they're like, man, I, I don't understand it. So I'd rather focus on people can understand war. You know, I mean, it's it's I don't want to oversimplify war because it's not a simple topic. But I feel like people can relate to that better. You're not making blockbuster movies about Adam Smith and the wealth of nations. You know? <laughs> Um, which, by the way, I've been to his grave. It's in Edinburgh, Scotland, and my Airbnb I, I, was right down the street from it. So, <laughs> yeah, we we went by it too. Uh, I love Edinburgh so much. Yeah. What so I think that I think it's a big issue of just it's a topic people don't understand. They don't want to take the time to understand, and so a lot of people just downplay it for those reasons. I got a lot of pushback from other history tubers um, when I tweeted that. Uh, I, I really triggered some of them and I was, <laughs> but I, the more I thought about it, I was like, I don't know if they have the same definition of economics that I do, because I think they were kind of like, 
thinking about it through just like, oh, uh, capitalism's good, blah, blah, blah. Like that, because uh, when really all, you know, people just think, oh, economics is about money. Um, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions about economics. It When really it's about um, scarcity. It's mm. about um, the fact that everything runs out. Everything that helps us, everything that's good, good that we, I keep doing the air quotes tonight. <laughs> How many times am I going to do the air? Every time I do an air quote, take a drink of eggnog. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, that the scarcity of the, the good stuff is why economics is even a thing. If we had an, yeah. an abundance of everything, economics would not even exist. Uh, and so I think a lot of people don't think, because yeah, what drives people ultimately more than anything, it's, they don't want scarcity. They want to survive. Yeah. So they will do whatever they can. And what drives nations is getting those things that their Resources. people need. Uh, yeah. Why did we end up at war with Japan in World War II? We got into World War II because of oil. oil. Because we were withholding oil from Japan that they needed to be able to fuel what they were doing. And we withheld that. It was an economic issue. Oh, thank you. I feel better about <laughs> myself now. I can pat myself on the back. All right. You're All right my turn. My turn, huh? Not Europe, but you are up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. What is the most important? Because you talk a lot about Supreme Court decisions. That's something you know a lot about. You just wrote a book about it. A little plug for your book there. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but what is the most important Supreme Court decision in history that people don't know enough about? Um, the the decision that people don't a know decision about? that is super important, but not a lot of people know about it. Let me just see here. Let me give my <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, hmm, this uh, this will be kind of nice because these are I picked a hundred that I think are the most important, mm -hmm. and I originally my list was 130, and so I had to like get rid of 30 because a lot of them kind of overlap. You, you know, you have like there was uh, three or four um, same sex marriage cases that all happened mm -hmm. or related to that, and obviously Obergefell was the, the biggest, but. Um, no, I think, um, now the biggest, yeah, I don't need this book. The biggest, the, by far the most important Supreme Court case in, in, uh, American history was Marbury v. Madison. Madison yep. Yeah. Because like. Judicial review, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause all the other cases wouldn't even have happened. True. Uh, if yeah. it weren't for the, they gave themselves this power essentially. <laughs> they like, because before Marbury v. Madison in 1803, so a little perspective here, the country had only, only been around for little over a generation um, before that the Supreme court um, and really the judicial branch overall was kind of an afterthought. Mm. Um, you had the legislative branch th that by far had the most power. And that was how the, the framers set it up. That's how it was supposed to be. And then you had the executive with the president who was slowly maybe getting a little bit more, more, more and more power by that point, because that was Thomas Jefferson. He had just done the Louisiana purchase at that same year. But then the judicial branch, uh, you know, you got John Marshall, little John, as I call him. He's just like, hey, uh, we may this case, this the specific case that they were deciding on. They were saying that um, they didn't have the authority. So but the irony was him saying that says, oh, but we could have the authority in the mm -hmm. future. And so that was a, like. It's so crazy to think about how much impact that had. At the time, nobody would have predicted it. And today, the Supreme Court, wow, how powerful are they yeah. now? We're nine yeah. people. In fact, uh, millions of Americans every four years, when they go to vote, they're really just voting for the Supreme Court justices now. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I know so many people that they voted for Joe Biden for what justices he would pick, not for yeah. they saw what happened with with Trump that he got three justices in there, and we saw what happened when, you know, Roe v. Wade got overturned was the big one, but a, a few other um, decisions and yeah, mm -hmm. like it's it's crazy how much power they have now. And I feel like, and and maybe this is just my own bias seeping in as I look at this, but I feel like the Republicans understood that better than the Democrats did. I think the Democrats okay. are figuring Absolutely. it out now. Yeah. Um, which it's is interesting common. because so much of Democrat, I don't want to say policy, but so much of what they were fighting for, they won through the courts yeah. over the last few generations. And yet it seemed like the Republicans understood 
that battle better than the Democrats did, at least for the last 15, 20 years. I think they it's kind of right now, though. Well, the Democrats got a lot of big wins in the 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, like, and it mostly was social issues. Yeah. So that, that's where I think the, the court has its most impact. But yeah, no, they, um, and then combined, I mean, you look at Mitch McConnell, I would say the, one of the most influential senators in um, American history, what he's been able to accomplish. And um, with the, not just the justices, but also, he was a one. He he spearheaded a lot of, of what went on with um, redistricting, um, mm-hmm. and so like gerrymandering, it, it's always been an issue. But it really picked up after 2010, after mm-hmm. the 2010 census, um, and of course 2020. Then Democrats retaliated, so they did the same thing even more, and then just boom, boom, you know, yeah. pop up, and it's, oh yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, great questions tonight. We'll speed this up though. Okay. Oh, I'll do a few super chats here. Um, thank you, Fluff Fluffacus. Uh, Jacques Jacques Stepan. Just wanted to say I, I love her, both your channels, and I love the history side of YouTube. Thank you so much, Jacques. Thank you, Jacques. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Emily says, longtime fan of you both. Thoughts on people learning history through things like shorts or TikToks? You do a lot more of those than I do these days. Um, I think it's great. I mean, my 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 kids sit there and watch TikTok all day long. And uh, if it's something they're going to be doing, if you can use it in a way, I mean, it's tough to communicate a deep historical topic topic in thirty seconds. Yeah. But if you can use it and reach people that might not otherwise be interested in history, why not? Yeah, I. At first, I was I was kind of um, hesitant to do it, um, but yeah, once I started the ball rolling, especially because my first few shorts did not do very well, mm-hmm. but I kind of figured it out like a mm-hmm. formula, and you kind of know exactly, kind of you just plug in like what you can fit in in a minute. And now TikTok penalizes you if you have a minute uh, mm-hmm. short because I just post the same thing, and so TikTok I don't make any money from, but occasionally I'll hop on and do a live there, and I, you know that's cool to have the interaction. But no, like I on YouTube, I don't make much money from those shorts. But the thing is, a lot of them bring in uh, new subscribers and those subscribers will stick around for the longer form content. Mm -hmm. And I keep telling other history tubers, it's like, no, trust me, they'll stick around. Like, especially if you make a a lot of times I will be researching for a, a 20 minute video or 30 minute video that I have. And then I'm like, Oh, this doesn't quite fit in this video, but it would be kind of a fun little short to do. Mm -hmm. And an example of that is I did a video about the Philippine American war, which you reacted to. Thank you for reacting to that. Um, And while I was researching that, I I learned about the KKK, which was the, uh, not the KKK, the white supremacist group from the United States, but the revolutionary uh, (laughs) group that (laughs) that led the movement to uh, declare independence from Spain and the Philippines in the late 1800s. And I was like, Oh, that's kind of uh, weird that they they're going around with these KKK flags and you still see them today in the Philippines Mm. and Americans would be like, what the heck's going on here? And and that's done well, but also a lot of people that watch that also stuck around for the Philippine American war videos. So yeah, it's good. I feel like I'm talking way too much tonight. This is, I'm going to be more brief. Okay. (laughs) Best, no, oh, we're on a fifth fifth question. Yeah. All right. Okay. Chris, what are the best YouTube videos you've watched this year? Oh boy. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you, the the series that Lamino did uh, on JFK on the Texas oh. School Book Depository was fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Course, everything he does is really good. Uh, but that that was really, really well done, well researched, well presented. Um, uh, that that's definitely up there for me. Um, I got to think about this one a little bit. That's the first one that jumped out. I'll go ahead and pull that. I'm going to pull these up as you're talking about them. Yeah, that, that was a really I actually. Because um... you just went there, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, the the only criticism I have of this is that it was just a little bit too much. Like we didn't have to get all that testimony. <laughs> but well, I think is, because he was focusing on one specific topic, he went deep dive on yeah. everybody connected to the school book depository. It's still 
really engaging. It really sucks you in. And I, I agree. It's one of the best videos I, I've seen in a long time. Um, okay. Are you, are you still looking? Cause yeah, while you're I'm, looking, still, I'm looking back. Cause I, I, I usually do. I, I'm, I, haven't started working on it, but usually at the end of the year, I'll do something about like my favorite 10 videos that I did a reaction to throughout the oh. year. Um, okay. Well, while you're doing that, I, I have a couple, yeah, um, channel five is a channel I watch a lot and, uh, he has just released a couple of San Francisco videos. Um, most of them I watch on my personal account. So you're going to say, Oh, he didn't actually watch it. No, this one, uh, came out just three days ago. And it's about a harm reduction. Oh, it's just, yeah. Harm reduction facility in San Francisco. Mm. And it's one of the best investigative journalism pieces. It's also propaganda though. Cause clearly the guy in this, that, that uh, kind of leads all this is Andrew Callahan. He clearly has, he's, he's trying to like promote a message, but despite that it's, it, he, this is what journalism should be and we're not getting it mm -hmm. in, you know, a lot of corporate media. We're, and so it's a breath of fresh air. What's even better than the harm reduction facility video is the video he did um, a couple weeks ago, which is called San Francisco streets. And he, um, you know, he'll like, he'll put in like news clips from local media outlets, but then he'll just, he's out on the streets with these people. Mm. He's interviewing people that are addicted to drugs. He's interviewing people that work at these harm reduction facilities. Um, you're hearing their stories and you're getting a completely different perspective than you normally get. And so I highly recommend. Um, he's not the guy I saw a video the other day. There was a guy doing something in San Francisco and he even pointed out, he said like, in my first 30 seconds making this video, I talked to somebody who was on drugs and saw yep, that's uh, it. carjacking. Was that him? That was him. That was I, it right I saw here. that video. That was really good. Yeah, it's it's uh, true journalism. That's the video right there. there that's is, exactly yeah. the one I saw. This one video right here, um, it has 5 million views. It should have 50 million. It is. This probably is my favorite video of the year, 2023. San Francisco Streets Channel 5 with Andrew Kelly. And look at, watch it, everybody. Yep, you know that's, what? That's Don't even the one I was just thinking about. Yeah. Did you find another one that you mm. that stood up to you? Yeah. So um, Mr. Beat did one that was really good on uh, all the president's <laughs> children that I really enjoyed a lot. Did uh, I do I've that? I've thinking about doing something like that myself. So I, I liked that one. I like all your presidential stuff, but that one was one of my favorites. Um, Aw, I, I liked Useful Charts series on the Christian denominations. It was really oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he even, he sent me the chart. I have it on my wall back here. Got a couple of his charts back there. Um, oh, nice. Fact, yeah, you can see just oh. there's three of his charts behind my Peloton bike over there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Nice. But Matt does a great job with all that stuff. And yeah, he was real, real kind. 99% of the videos that I do reactions to the people reach out to me either publicly or privately and are very supportive. Yeah. And I've become friends with a lot of them. And, and honestly, one of the favorite things about the fact that I do reaction videos is that I've kind of become this gathering point where people get to learn about channels. Maybe they haven't discovered yet for whatever reason. I mean, by now everybody knows about yours because you're closing in on a million subscribers, but um, you know, there are other channels out there that have 10 or 15,000 subscribers that are fantastic that people just haven't discovered yet. Yes. And if I can do a reaction video of theirs and maybe send a few thousand subscribers their way. Awesome. There's a, there's a, a guy who does videos um, called it's called roaming history. And I don't know how many subscribers he's up to now, but he does stuff on the civil rights movement and it's historic site content. So like he went to the central school in Little Rock. There he wow. is. Well, how many subscribers is he up to now? Almost uh, 3,000. 3, yeah. He was at 700 subscribers when I did my first reaction to him and we doubled him in 24 hours uh, to like 1500 subscribers just from me doing that reaction video. Uh, and his content's really good. And he goes to these sites and tells these stories. He's got one about Emmett Till that I'm going to cover at some point. It's a heavy topic, but um, he does a really, really good job. So if you're interested in the civil rights movement, you want to see the the sites where these things, these these events happened, he does a really good job covering those things. I had never heard of this channel. Yeah, Thanks for introducing it's good. me. Good stuff. <laughs> um, and then there was one more. Um, I'm going to be actually 
collaborating with these guys, um, a channel called Decades. They're British. And they did a video on the history of pubs, and it was fantastic, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's them. Uh, so I'm gonna. They live up n like near Manchester in the UK, and I'm gonna I'm gonna connect. There, there's for you. The first one suggested is the history of pubs. There you go. It's really good. <laughs> All right, I'll watch that later and subscribe to him now. I, yeah, I like that that you do. Actually, I, you you partially inspired me to do that one. Um, uh, live stream where I was trying to like give shots out shout outs to a bunch of smaller history. Oh yeah, yeah. There's so many now. The community is so big now. It's a it's wonderful. It's a wonderful problem to have all this content. It's too much content. <laughs> but yeah, something. All right, I think it's my turn, huh? Yes. I before I get sucked into watching this. Uh, well, this is actually <laughs> similar to what you just asked me. Other than history and music, which we know you're passionate about, those things. What is a genre of YouTube videos that you spend a lot of time watching? Oh, wow. Yeah. No. Uh, well, I mean, that Channel 5, I think, is a lot of culture channels mm -hmm. and geography. Um, I like I like uh, channels where they just go to places I've never been that I want to go to because you can only see so much on Google Earth and Google Maps. And so mm -hmm. people that walk around and just show you what it looks like on the ground or... Uh, the, they call them drive lapse videos where people are just have the, there's the some that are like walking them. tours where people, they don't narrate. They just walk around a city yeah. for 45 minutes and show you what it looks like just to walk around. Yeah. Those are cool. Yep. Uh, I had geography King on the last episode and he's one of the few channels I watch every single video of his. Um, and so uh, it was almost a weird parasocial thing where I felt like I, I knew him better than he knew me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like, uh, Let's see. There was a the other video I wanted to give a shout out is uh, H Bomber Guy who really shook things up. Do you, you know who H Bomber Guy is? I don't think so. No. Um, he only releases like one video a year these days, but um, he did one about plagiarism. Oh, um, I think I did see that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that was the name of the really, channel, but I really seen that stirred, video. Yeah, like this whole platform was shaken up by him last week. Um, and that might be one of the best videos of the year as well. I was going to let me pull that one up here. Um, but yeah, he he does. A, I mean, it's I guess it's kind of political content, too, but it's more cultural stuff. I really mm -hmm. like a lot of the cultural analysis stuff because, um, you know, the political pundits kind of where they're just kind of reacting to the news of the day. That gets old. Mm -hmm. The streamers that kind of gets old. But stuff like this. Yeah. It's yes, up to nine yeah. million views already. Holy crap! It's like a three-hour video or something, isn't it? At two and a half, throw it four hours. I put that. I think it was last Saturday night when he released it, and that night I put it on the TV, and I stayed up past midnight watching it. That's how good it is. Jeez, and he's uh, getting a, a million views a day on that video. Good for him. Dang. <laughs> and, and with it being that long, that's some major watch time right there. Well, yeah. He, Jeez. Him and his team, they make engaging stuff. You can never react to it, though, because it's uh, yeah. too long. You'd have to break it down into like a 40-part series. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, actually, that leads to my next question. Actually, the the kind of the something we should, I was wanting to bring up later on because I wanted to build up to it. But mm -hmm. obviously, you you got into some drum, hit drama <laughs> um, last, when was that, last summer or something? Yeah. Um, where okay, so for those who don't know, I'll, maybe I'll let you explain it. But like, CGP Gray mm -hmm. uh, took made you uh, well copyright struck a couple of your videos. Mm -hmm. if, you, if for those of you who don't know, if you are if you get three copyright strikes on your videos, they shut your channel down. That's it. And you had two, both yep. him. Now, fortunately, it had a happy ending. He. He uh, did not uh, like pursue it further, and right. then the copyright expired, right? Yeah. So, so how it works is, first of all, if you like, say, when I do a reaction video, um, if I use even thirty seconds of somebody else's video, they're gonna have. You can go in uh, on your channel in your analytics, and you can see when other people have used some percentage of your content. And I've, I have people who, who have done reactions to my videos. And so I can see that. And then you have a choice to do nothing or you can 
respond to it in some way. And, and, and I think in most cases, there are really two options. You can give a, a takedown order, which basically says you've got a week to take this down or else you will get a copyright strike if, if you don't take it down on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, you, of course, you can do nothing, and, and that's what happens 99% of the time. Uh, the other option is do an immediate copyright strike, which um, then either way that puts it back to me then, and I have to respond and I can appeal it. Uh, and then it goes back to that person again. And now the ball's in their court. And in this case with CGP Gray, um, he did he did the first copyright strike. I appealed it. And within like 30 seconds of me appealing it, he copy, did the copyright strike on a second video. It was like retaliation for me appealing the first one. Um, so then I didn't, I didn't, and I'd only done, I think three of his videos anyway. So I just immediately took down the third one and just, just took it down before anything could happen with it, appealed the other two. And then the way YouTube's rule, rules work, if somebody does a copyright strike against you, you can, you have to fill out this whole long form explaining why it's not a copyright violation here, are my justifications for why it's not. Um, mm -hmm. And then he then either has to take legal action and actually go to court to make a copyright claim or YouTube drops it and it, yeah. the video goes back up. And so he didn't take it to that next step and it kind of just died down at that point. Um, and he did catch a lot of flack from that. And I, uh, I was surprised at the number of history YouTubers who came to my defense, not only just privately, like, Hey, Hey, Chris, we're on your side. We support you. A lot of people did that. But the number of people like like Griffin from the Armchair Historian who like got on Twitter and was like actively posting support to me and things like that. So I was, yeah. I was blown away by that. And for those who aren't familiar with me or for, with what I do, um, my personal policy is that if I know a content creator does not support what I do, I don't do reactions to their video. So I will never do another CGP Grey video now right. that I know that's how he feels. I just felt <laughs> that's there how he let you know. He, he yeah, could have sent you an email. I, just, I feel like there were a lot of steps we could have taken before we got to that point. Yeah. Um, same thing with Lamino. Lamino is a phenomenal content creator, and I've done reactions to a few of his videos. He's, he's never taken any action against me. He's never done a takedown or a copyright strike, anything like that. But he made a video a couple of months ago where he expressed how he felt about reaction videos. And he is not a fan. Yeah. And I saw that. And even though he never did anything against me, uh, I won't do any more just out of respect of his wishes in that way. Yeah. Um, same thing with um, knowing better. Knowing better, you know, I've had the chance to, to meet personally and talk to him. Um, people ask me all the time when I'm going to do reaction to his. I won't because I know he doesn't like it. Uh, and I'm fine with that. I, I will respect him for that. And I have no issue there. I haven't even asked you my question, but yeah, you already answered <laughs> a lot of that. No, like, okay, just a little bit, bit of background with where I come from with this, because I was I was hearing both sides of it from, mm -hmm. from all over. And I was like, uh, I became a fence setter, sitter because I was like, I can hear the arguments on both mm -hmm. sides are good. Like, originally, I was like heavily on your side because it was like, as long as the creator is okay with it, it's additional exposure for mm -hmm. the um, the person making the videos. Um, and so, well, Mike, okay, let me just ask you the question first. Like, did this whole experience, because I know it was a lot of, like, there were other YouTubers making videos about this. And mm -hmm, you, yeah. like, every day I saw you, were, like, I remember one video you were in your car. And you, it, I could tell you were stressed out by this whole thing. <laughs> And I was like, that I was when it first cool. happened. I was at Walmart and I got the notification and I made a video right there in my car at Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> well, but your community is, is uh, top notch. They've been very supportive largely and uh, you have great viewers. Um, but I, I also, I want to like, uh, did this change your perspective at all going through all of this on as far as anything? A little bit. Um, I, I'm, I'm a pretty stubborn person in general. So <laughs> If this had happened 10 years ago, I probably would have dug my heels in a lot more and I probably would have done more reactions to his videos just to dare him to do it again. Oh, um, but I'm not that guy anymore. I, I don't like the drama. I would rather avoid the drama whenever possible. For those who aren't familiar, I mean, reaction content is obviously a big 
debated topic on this platform and there's such a variety of it right because there's a lot of people who just do like basically play a video and like they'll go grab something to eat while it's playing and that kind of stuff and yeah, those that are stuff to me is never okay and if i if i'm doing a reaction video and i don't feel i can add something of value that isn't already in the original content i'm not going to do it to me the original video is my textbook as a teacher and i'm using that as a discussion starter to springboard. to springboard into additional not even necessarily always deeper because like your videos are already very deep and so it's not like i'm i'm having to provide information that you're missing but maybe talk about some parallels and maybe make some connections and think about because we all can get tunnel vision when we talk talk about a topic and there are going to be things I'm going to think of about that topic you wouldn't. There are things you're going to cover that I wouldn't think to say. Yeah. Um, so if it gives us a chance for more discussion, then great. Uh, and, and legally speaking, technically speaking, I don't have to have an original content creator's permission. Uh, right. If it's considered fair use, which there's a debate about what that means. Yeah. We'll have that discussion. <laughs> But if it's considered fair use, you don't have to have permission. But it's it's a personal uh, a personal preference for me that I don't want to I don't want to intentionally antagonize people who don't like what I do. There's enough yeah. content creators out there who are supportive of what I do that I don't need to go making trouble for them or for me. If people don't want me to, I won't do it. It's not a big deal. It really isn't. So yeah, you do. You do. I'm a little more hesitant. Uh, it did probably make me stay with content creators i already know a little more and it made me more hesitant to jump out and cover new folks that i hadn't before because oh, yeah. i was afraid of that a little bit but well the the arguments that got me more towards the middle the fence um you're probably not surprised to hear but just the fact that you know you make original content as well mm -hmm. and so you know it's hard to make original content yeah i mean when you're piecing it together we're talking about Dozens of hours um, of editing, of writing, yep. research. And then, um, I mean, we could easily spend 100 hours on one video, just one video if it's, you know, 45 minutes long a lot of times. And then somebody comes along and spends an hour doing a reaction video and gets... Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's 100 hours versus one hour of work. Yep. And, so, and so that got me more to the fence so I can see that side of it. And I know CGP Grey mm -hmm. and others, they do spend a lot of time on their videos. That's why they don't release that much. Right. Um, because the, of the animations required. Um, but then, like, I also kind of, something that hasn't been brought up that's more towards your defense that I find myself also wanting to, like, because I, I haven't heard it, is that all of us, all of us kind of steal from yeah. Like you you're, everything you're putting into your video came from somebody else's work that they exactly. did. Yeah. So, so, so CGP Gray, his he's got a lot of views from flag videos. He didn't design any of those flags. He's reacting to flags that are already there, isn't he? And and, and somebody so, actually told me that his flag video, like his rules for how he judged them, actually came from somebody else. Oh, but easily. he didn't even invent that. Yeah. So I mean, and then all of us history tubers. The stories already are written. Right. We just have to like kind of um, fine tune them in a way that's more digestible to the viewer. But like, so we have it easy. Mm -hmm. I think that I I have the most respect for um, the you know like the writers in Hollywood and that write TV shows. When you when you have like Vince Gilligan, to me is one of the greatest creative minds of our generation. Yeah. Like 100%. he's the creator of yeah. uh, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, Vince Gilligan is a genius. Him and his team, credit to the whole team, because there's usually, they just come up with this from thin air. Now, but even them, they are influenced by shows that came before. Like, mm -hmm. And so none of us live in a vacuum. We're all influenced by everyone. But I guess like, I don't know. I, I, I think what it comes down to is like, some people are like, I worked my butt off. Mm -hmm. And you should have to work your butt off too. Yeah. That's literally what, cause like, yeah, I just, I recently paid off my student loans. Nice. And people were like, and I know I was, yeah, that, I, that's the first issue I thought of was the student loan thing. When it's you like, said well, that, I paid I it, off. Off, you it off too. Yeah. No, no. If, if, uh, if they end up forgiving student loans, like 
now, I wouldn't care. I'd be like happy for you. You know, the thing is like, we want things to be easier. And the thing is, AI is going to be doing a lot of this stuff pretty soon anyway. Yeah. So we better be ready for it. Like yep. uh, it sucks that some of us work a lot harder that, but you, you have to come up with tricks like to you, you reel people in with your reactions and their quality reactions. But then you also, you're, like you said at the very beginning of this whole thing, your your passion is going to the, these locations and filming the telling the stories on. Mm-hmm. So you've gotten viewers, yeah, slowly, but yeah, that's how it, <laughs> you've got. Another thing I would in. say to the people, and I agree hundred percent that I think that's the main issue is the the time that's been put into a an original content video versus yeah. the time it takes me. And honestly, it's frustrating to me when I spend when I go to Europe and I make original content and I spend all the time editing and I can do a reaction video, get 10 times the views uh, yep. of all of that. But I will say this to counter that a little bit. The reason I'm able to so effortlessly do a reaction video now is because of the 30 years that I spent studying this stuff in the first place. That too. So I yeah. have put thousands of hours into putting myself into a position where I can watch a topic that I've never covered before and just without having watched it before or done any research, be able to do those reactions like that. So I guess that's one other way of looking at it a little bit. I was going to say other people could just do that, right? They could just do it. And I say that to people when they say that, I'm like, well, if it's that easy, why aren't you doing it? You're an idiot if you're not doing it, if it's that easy. So by the way, I, I react to history videos on Twitch every Monday at nine. Every Monday. Yep. I see the posts for those. Yeah. <laughs> And you're partially the reason. Uh, shout out to Mr. Terry as well. Because like he's the godfather of history reaction. That's right. He did it before you. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, All right, is it my turn? Uh one, two, three. Oh, that was such a yes, it's your turn. We're still on okay. the sixth question. All right, here we go. Um if you could go, this is a little different than anything. Uh Mr. Terry says, haha. Um, if you could go back in time and have a conversation with 16 year old Matt beat, what would you say to him? <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just, I've, I said this before in another live stream at some point, but I, I really don't think I get along with my younger self. Um, I was much more bigoted back then. Um, and like, you know, narrow minded as far as um, I thought I had everything figured out, you know, mm-hmm. and so it's hard to teach humility. But I think I would try to, like, uh, put my younger self into a I mean, that's what you were saying earlier, as far as like traveling to other countries and like experiencing different things as much as possible, because I think that's at the root of most problems in the world is a lack of empathy. And uh, when you have a lack of empathy, you dehumanize groups mm-hmm. of people. When you dehumanize, it's all over. Like that's just going to lead to all the the wars and stuff. So, uh, so yeah, I think I, I had that back then. You know, like when I was sixteen, I I had never even. I well, fortunately, my parents did travel across the country. We took vacations and stuff, mm-hmm. but I did have a fairly fundamentalist upbringing, and so I I, um, I think something that opened my eyes more than anything was just getting away from home and kind of seeing the world traveling and, you know, when I was in college, I, it was the first time, like the first time I had friends who had a different religion than me or a different mm-hmm. skin color than me or um, political beliefs than me. <laughs> like it's amazing when people are, you know, and it's easy to be in a bubble when you're younger. Mm-hmm. So I would just, uh, that's actually one of the first videos I made was um, just how to get out of your bubble because mm. Um, I feel like a lot of us are trapped and we don't even, it's not our faults, but because of social media is only part of it. It always gets blamed for everything, but just even without social media, we would just, we don't even know our neighbors half the time. You know, we don't leave our houses. We, um, we watch what we want to watch. We talk to who we want to talk to because we can. And man, we, if I had a nickel for every time yeah, I go told ahead. somebody that I was a conservative Christian and they got to know me and they were like, you were nothing like I expected <laughs> because they had in their minds the we we judge everybody by the loudest people on social media. 
And we think that those people represent all people. And then I meet people and they're like, you're a Christian? Really? You're a pastor? I'm like, yeah. Well, you're nothing like I expected. No, because you think that all of us are like the really loud, obnoxious one that says those really controversial things on, on social media. Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, getting out of your bubble and actually getting to know people who think differently than you. You know, I, I went 35 years without being able to know, say that I knew personally a single Muslim, not one. I don't think that I'd ever known one more than to say hi to them. Uh, and then I actually got roomed with uh, a guy who was a Muslim. Uh, who was a new presenter for Rachel's Challenge, and here I was, a Christian pastor, reading my Bible on my uh, on my bed, while my roommate was over on the floor praying to Mecca. And I'm telling you, we could not have gotten along better. He was one of the most phenomenal people I've ever met in my life. We were total opposites, religiously, our background, everything, and we got along great because yeah. we didn't judge each other based on the stupid people that you see on social media. We judged <laughs> each other on. Who was in front of us? Yeah. Yeah. And even the people on social media that are loud and obnoxious are only that way because they know it gets them attention. Yep. hundred percent. I've been guilty of that. Sometimes trolling people just because I know it will. <laughs> but I also yeah. like, I'm always, I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of, out of like making people uncomfortable. <laughs> to me, one of my pet peeves is people that are so comfortable and confident with their beliefs and as a teacher, that's what oftentimes we're playing devil's advocate because I found myself as a teacher oftentimes like um, the kids would agree with my my political beliefs. And I was like, this is not good. Mm. This is not, I do not want my my students to have the same political beliefs as me. And so yeah. I would find myself arguing, like saying kind of out there things. And actually, I'll never forget how um, doing that actually led me to change my mind about um, the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hmm. I used to be a firm, like it was the most evil thing ever. I used to be far in that camp and I, I came well over to, I'm still on the fence, but I, I didn't I did, let that experience change me a lot because like me playing devil's advocate then got them thinking. And then they ended up coming with arguments that were even, hmm. Oh, I had never even thought about that before. So yeah, I think uh, I've definitely my my political views have and my views on things in general have definitely softened the older I've gotten. Um, like you said about being hard headed <laughs> and knowing everything at 16. Yeah, um, I've always been conservative. I'm I'm the least conservative I've ever been at this point in my life. I think uh, most people actually become more conservative. conservative. Yeah. yeah. People tend to get more conservative as they get older. Do I've actually think? gone the other direction. Yeah. Well. <laughs> But what I think it is, though, and I think there's certain things people become more conservative on as they get older, mm. and they just because they're tired of, you know, I'm done. But at the same time, like even my grandparents who are um, in their late 80s, like um, so I, they, I think they've adjusted to modern society better than I like, will I adjust like that? Like when, if I make it to, to 90 years old, will I be OK with? what the kids are doing these days. You know, I wonder that, you know, <laughs> cause it's, it, yeah, that you just kind of have to keep an open mind. Mm -hmm. My daughter has, my daughter's 18 now and she's very interested in politics and what's going on in the nice. world and things like that. And she really challenges me on a lot of things. And cause I don't, I don't typically talk about that stuff. I don't talk about it on YouTube. I don't watch news like national news at all. I, I used to be, glued to it all the time i just can't i can't yeah. do it anymore i just i get frustrated i get like I, I get tired of what i see and what i hear i don't watch it so but she has really challenged me and we were having conversations just this morning on the way to the dentist about what was going on in israel and palestine and all that stuff and she was really <laughs> kind of coming at it from a very different perspective than i was and we were talking through that and i think we were both challenging each other and it was very healthy to do that i think i the last thing i want is all my kids to think and act exactly like i do that's hot. Well, you sound like a good dad then. <laughs> uh, okay, we got a few super chats here. I'm sorry if I haven't I haven't kept up with these. I feel kind of bad, but thank you for all your support. And John says maybe America should have have had the students seeing internment camps. Um, so I think there, well, this is back to when we were talking about um, the German mm -hmm. students who were seeing the the camps on field trips and stuff. Yeah, like 
I don't think any of those places are around to anymore other than museums uh, talking about the internment. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny that you brought up uh, Israel Palestine conflict. Cause I had this question. <laughs> um, I think uh, we probably don't want to get in the weeds with that, but uh, I think one thing I will say is that it, it has been, it's something where I think everybody's and JJ McCullough said this in one of his videos, but so I'm kind of stealing from him. I'm plagiarizing. Um, but basically, whatever your beliefs about foreign policy, um, when it comes to any any war around the world, any conflict around the world, I think can all be wrapped up with what side you're mm -hmm. on. I did the air quote again. You could take a drink of your eggnog. <laughs> um, well, yeah, what side you're on with uh, either Palestine or Israel. And I... Um, it is something I feel like we should just, you said not watching the news. Yeah. I don't think we should. I don't even think anyone knows what's going on. No, and I, there. I, I think <laughs> one of the, the worst parts cool. about this whole thing is that everybody has reduced it to sound bites and buzzwords. Yep. Everybody wants to throw around words like genocide uh, and, and and like everything and in life, and on the other side, yeah. Oh, you're criticizing. You're an anti. You're anti. Yeah, yeah, or you're right. anti-Semitic. Exactly. Yeah. Like everything in life, this is a super complex situation, and there's no black and white. And everybody wants to make it black and white, either this or that. Nobody can say, you know what? Maybe both sides have a point, and maybe both sides are really screwing up too. Uh, that can all be true at the same time. I feel like everybody has forced everyone to take a side in this. I don't know that there is a side except for the side of justice and life, really. There you go. Leave it, we'll leave it at that. Uh, and then this person here, thank you for that. Both my grandparents uh, are Holocaust survivors. Mm. Thank you for talking about that subject. Our pleasure. So my, my daughter's boyfriend is an Orthodox Jew. Uh, and so oh. as someone who's really into family history, I've been researching his family history. Uh -huh. uh, and his great grandmother was at Bergen Belson at the same time that Anne Frank and her family were there. Oh my so God. He, he didn't know that. And I told him and he said, that's really probably the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. Not that it was cool that his great grandmother was in a oh, concentration camp because he knew she that. had been. But to know that she was that connected with history in that way and to understand that his family had a personal connection, that his great grandmother was another woman that was held at the same time, Anne and Margot Frank were in that place. And, uh, yeah, just one of the cool ways that even ugly parts of history, we can find our connections to it. I couldn't imagine being one of those grandparents, though, still like and hearing kids say, you know, or downplaying the Holocaust. Like, I don't know, I, that gets me all fired up. <laughs> On a lighter note, Emperor Tiger Star. Uh, hey. Favorite <laughs> he asked us a long time ago, I think, but my favorite band of all time was Radiohead. My second Ooh. favorite band, Weezer. Nice. Sure. Weezer yeah. has the song Buddy Holly, who uh, is all, my all time favorite artist. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I love Buddy Holly. Uh, oh, man. I was going to make a video about songs at one time or another. Um, but Sabaton's my current favorite band of the moment, I think. Um, Swedish metal band that all their songs are about history. My first reaction video I ever did was a Sabaton song. So that's right. Uh, speaking of Sweden, I went to Lindsborg, Kansas this past weekend. Little Sweden, USA. Shout out to Sweden. And, and you have have you have you talked to Indy Nidell before? No, no you haven't because no. he does all the Sabaton history. He's from the he was on the World War One channel and now he does the World War Two channel. Um, yes, and he reached out to with me him. a while back after I did a reaction to one of his videos. Super nice guy, and had a yeah. lot of fun. I'm going to try to connect with him when I get over to well, Europe. And he has an MTV background. He used to be yep. a VJ, right? Yep. Very cool. Yeah, I, I'd love to chat with him in an episode. Uh, Jeremy Hodge, thank you. Bio, bio biopics you'd like to see for under underrepresented historical figures. Asking as someone who. Had, Attempted to write a Thomas Paine biopic. I that's a lovely idea. I would I would totally watch a Thomas Paine. These biopic. are the times that try men's souls. One of my favorite quotes from history. Oh man, Paine was a character. That uh, would be an interesting biopic because he was such a 
popular writer during the war, but then was very much ostracized after the revolution because of some yeah. of his views later on in life. So it would be interesting. Yeah. Uh, I funny he mentioned that because uh, the one I've always said would be, I would love a really good biopic treatment of Grant. Uh, and I'm actually, tomorrow morning, I have a video chat with a guy who's writing a screenplay for uh, a biopic on Grant that might be like oh a, a mini series or it might yeah. be a movie, but I'm going to be like his historical advisor on it. So we're, we're meeting oh. to go over the outline of the script tomorrow. Oh, so cool. So cool, man. You stay busy. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. So um, I would say Andrew Jackson for sure. <laughs> um, you mentioned Teddy Roosevelt earlier and a, a new one. Um, uh, Non-presidents, maybe someone who ran for president, uh, Belva Lockwood, who I just researched quite a mm. bit for my latest video, Every Woman Who went, Ran for President. She was the first woman who ran for president that actually got votes. Um, for and that was, that was before women had the right to vote, wasn't it? And, yeah. yeah, well, they did in some territories, but yeah, not in like state. Wyoming, yeah. Yeah. All right, back to the questions here. Uh, we've we're almost hitting two hours here. I want to keep it rolling. <laughs> You're not okay. surprised, are you? You can't be surprised. No, I'm not. But <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, so we are both uh, technically Midwestern. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't know. I have a lot of observations I notice about Midwestern culture that I wonder if you share. So I, I'm just going to ask you this. Um, oh, and by the way, we're at the opposite yeah. so opposite ends of the Midwest. Yeah, yeah you're, you're in uh, Eastern Ohio. I'm in... Uh, Eastern Kansas, and those mm -hmm. kind of like the geographic edges of it. Anyway, um, you have so say you're at the airport, and you have five Americans that are sitting next to each other in front of you, and you're just kind of looking at them, you know, checking them out, people watching, trying not to be creepy. Uh, <laughs> and you, uh, one of them is from the East Coast, one of them is from the West Coast, one of them is from the South, one is from the Rocky Mountain West. And one is from the Midwest. How can you tell who the Midwestern person is? <laughs> uh, first of all, I would, um, I think the quickest way out of that group would probably be to ask them what this is. Because <laughs> I saw a map the other day and the area of the country that calls this pop is shrinking. Yep. Because um, in the South, they call it Coke. Um, in most other places, I think they call it soda now. Yeah. Um, so that'd be one way. Um, I think they'd be the ones without an accent to me, to my ear, the one without an accent is the Midwesterner because we don't have an accent. Everybody else does. Um, American West doesn't have accent either. That's true. Like Colorado. That's true. I mean, yeah. they, they don't really talk a lot different in Colorado, for example, than they do here. So yeah, that might be hard. I think the pop thing is the first thing that pops in my mind, pops in my mind. Um, I think I have an easier time talking to Midwesterners than I do other people. Even when I speak in schools, I feel like I connect better with Midwestern kids than I do kids in other parts, parts of the country. I don't know why they laugh at my jokes more. They relate to my style a little more. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if I could put on a fi my finger on something specific about what that would be that would set me at ease with those people. Um, I will say this, when I go to New York City, I feel like I'm in a foreign country. And I don't mean because there are foreign people there, because that's true in any big city. Like, mm -hmm. I just feel like the culture feels like a foreign country to me. Uh, just the culture of a big city in the East, or even up in New England, going to Maine or somewhere like that. It does, it feels like a different country sometimes. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know if I could put any uh, my thumb on it, like a specific thing that I could say to be able to tell. But you would just kind of know, I think. But here's the thing. It's funny. Being in Northeast Ohio, in many ways, we're more of a Yankee culture than we are Midwest in Northeast Ohio, whereas yeah. the rest of the state, like you go south of Columbus, which is only two and a half hours from here, mm -hmm. and you're in Kentucky, really. I mean, that's the the, the language is like the accent is Kentucky. Um, yeah. you know, the rest of the state is very flat. I live in a hilly part. I'm, I'm only a half hour from West Virginia. I'm eight miles from Pennsylvania. Um, so I would say that where I live is different than even the rest of Ohio, let alone the mess of the rest of the Midwest. Um, 
we would probably talk about sports. Uh, I would see, I would probably <laughs> see something they were wearing, like if if they were wearing like a Michigan shirt or Ohio. They're more State likely to wear a sports shirt for sure. Yeah. And I think in the Midwest, that's probably one of the easiest things that we can relate on a level with is sports. If you see somebody wearing something, that gives you an immediate thing to start talking about. And probably people in the other parts of the country do that too. But mm-hmm. it used to be the Big Ten. You know, all the Big Ten schools were in the Midwest. Now we're all over the country. So there, that was kind of a unique thing we had too. But, of course, even Nebraska's in the Big Ten now. So Yeah, it's all, all the conference changes in the last few years has really – I don't know. How would you answer that question? The thing I first think of is – the Midwestern person would probably be most easy to talk to mm-hmm. more, most willing extroverted. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it's a tough thing though. I, and there's also like a certain, um, I think uh chip on their shoulder. Mm. Like uh, it's not that they work harder, but it feels like they have to like, they have more to prove oh, about yeah. them. And I just, I notice that whenever I go to conferences and I kind of, there's people from around the country and I, I'm like, I play that game. I'm like, Oh, who's from the Midwest here. And, and a lot of the, the Midwestern folks gravitate toward each other. Mm-hmm. I also noticed that. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, anyway, it's weird. weird yeah, that's to... true. All right. Um, All right. My turn. turn. Yes. Um, okay. Here's kind of a lighthearted one. So we know about music and YouTube. What is a hidden talent that Mr. Beat has that the public doesn't know much about? <laughs> uh, I have zero talents. Uh, I, well, I played I played soccer uh, oh, yeah? in college. Oh, wow. Uh, I, did, I had a scholarship. I played defender, uh, right back. Yeah. yeah. That was my son's position last year. Oh, nice. Yeah. I got burnt out i stopped playing mm-hmm. after i mean I, I went back to play indoor soccer for a little while but um i think you know when you get older i much rather play tennis uh because mm-hmm. it's better on you know less likely to get injured <laughs> so do you still play uh, tennis now oh yeah i yep. play tennis uh i recently discovered pickleball but oh tennis is i'll probably play tennis as long as i possibly can i love that sport and i used to coach tennis as well uh, but I would, yeah, I would not call them talents. I, the thing is I was always just kind of mediocre at everything. Um, I don't know. I think something that is kind of underrated as a skill that I wish I maybe fostered more is like writing a song mm-hmm. is actually like an original song is really difficult. Like, uh, and I'm actually making a video right now for my other channel about how a lot of pop singers, um, you know, they say they they co-write the song. There, take a drink of eggnog. <laughs> they co-write the song, but really, you know, like Taylor Swift, she mm-hmm. she co-writes her songs, and she has kind of written her. But really, it's not. It's really she has a team that writes right. for her. And you wonder. Most I don't of think- those people do, and they their record labels will will connect them with a person. Yeah. to get their creative juices flowing and send them away for the weekend with another writer and say, hey, go write songs. And like and Ed Sheeran... I don't know much they're actually contributing to the writing yeah. process. So Ed Sheeran like, says that he writes like 60 songs a month or like 60... I think he said... I read somewhere he writes several songs a day. And He's he'll write good. hundreds of songs to come up with the 10 or 12 that end up on an album. And that's just crazy to me. Well, he's the true songwriter, though. He's yeah, a kind exactly. of a rarity because he, a lot of times, yeah, he writes songs for other people. And so I think he's the exception to the norm, but yeah. it's not easy. So that you got to admire no, that's that. True. Now, twice I have I have sat down on two different occasions and written an entire song in like 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, it doesn't Those usually the best happen. Songs. The ones uh, that come, They yeah. are the best ones. They're probably my two best songs I've written. Yeah. Uh, one yeah, of no. them was, and they were born out of specific situations. I was... I was going to be, my band was going to play for Faith Night at, for the Mahoning Valley Scrappers. They're a class A baseball team. And so we were doing the music before the game and they would get like 6,000 people at these games. Uh, I was sitting practicing the night before. And at the time, my son, Caleb was three, he's 16 now. And he came up to me while I was practicing and he said, you wrote a song for mommy and you wrote a song for my sister, but you haven't written a song for me. Oh. And so I sat down right there and in like 15 minutes wrote a song for my son. Uh, like just kind of came to me, right. I hadn't even been planning on writing. Um, so that was just one of those examples where, and I I feel like sometimes 
when you're not overthinking it is when sometimes it can come. But yeah, it's, it's hard. Yeah. It is hard. Let it flow. That's cool. Yeah. So I've written about 250 songs in my life. Oh, wow. Probably. I haven't written nearly that many. I've probably written 40 at most. Not that they were good songs. Mm. But. <laughs> uh, all right. Cool. That's. Oh, wow. Thank you for all these. I'm not going to get to all these, am I? Um, I'll try to hit the bigger ones here. Uh, Zor Valakan, thank you. Uh, what's your favorite ancient history subjects? Hmm. I would say I'm I'm really into, uh, I mean, I guess we're assuming pre, prehistory, right? Like before mm-hmm. the written word. Uh, I would say Neolithic stands out to me. That's my... Uh, was it ancient aliens? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when I think ancient, I, I, I tend to like, at least for me, I don't know what the real definition of it is, but I guess like before the Roman empire, cause you know, we all think about the Roman empire. Um, oh, but, well, uh, Egyptians, Egyptians is fun. Egypt is, is one for me yeah. that I'd really like to learn more about. Um, like that, the time, like when they built the pyramids and you're talking what, 4,500 years ago. And I don't think people realize how, how long ago that was that those were built. Oh crazy. my God. Think about it. Yeah, no, it's crazy. When the aliens helped them build them. <laughs> uh, but some of the Neolithic structures that still exist are yeah. even, before, even earlier, thousands, yeah. even a thousand years before. Uh, have either of you watched a little known channel with only 2 million subs called Tasting History? Yes, I have. Yep. It's, a, it's brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. I enjoy it a lot. It's a, it's a great niche. Like I don't want to say niche because they got two million subscribers, but uh, it, it's a it's a cool way of focusing on a particular aspect of history that maybe a lot of other people don't. And I've wanted to do more of that, like experiential stuff. Like I want to see what it's like to to eat food that they ate at that time, or to fire a musket from the Revolutionary War, and you know see how that impacts my views on history to actually experience what people experience. Because I think it would have to. It would have to change how you view certain things in history when you actually do them yourself. Yeah, no, it's. I mean, they get a lot of people who normally would not watch history content sure. in, yeah. into it. Somebody says we need a Mr. B V T H twenty twenty four for you need ticket. I remember somebody said the same thing. I've Maybe seen that a few times. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the last live stream we did together. That's really nice. What was the? There's a movie, and I don't remember what it was called, but it had Jack Lemon and. Um, I forget who else it was, but they played yeah, ex presidents. Yes, I I remember that movie. It was a great movie. It I, was, I, and they're they're on the run, and oh, Dan Aykroyd is in it, I think, or no, not Dan Aykroyd. Um, anyway, uh, but they end up running on a unity ticket, and like as they're going out to make the announcements, they're still debating about which one's going to be president, and which one's going to be vice president when they make the announcement because they've both been president before. Dan Aykroyd was in it. It's called was My he. Pro- he- my fellow Americans. That's yeah. it. Good movie. That was a really good movie. <laughs> yeah, I want to watch that again. Uh, okay, one more just because this is a very nice comment. Um, John Brown's body says, watching both of you for years helped spark my love of history. I'm planning on going to college next year to major in history and going to teaching. That's, That's awesome. awesome. We Anytime that, we can we convert that. somebody. I feel like we're converting them into like a... <laughs> like a, It's not a cult. We're converting them into... <laughs> And to the just disciples, the disciples, yeah, disciples of the of next history. generation. Yeah, we um, we need yeah. there's so many. Like, Absolutely, we need more good history. And, and the bottom line is, you talk talk to almost anybody who fell in love with history in high school. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the subjects; it was how good was their teacher. Like, did their teacher yeah. make them love history? If you had a good teacher, who passed on their passion of history, you probably picked up on that. And, and, and YouTube's just another form of that is mm-hmm. finding people that you can connect to that instill in you a love of history. Um, and we need people who can do that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We'll put, and we're on to question eight here. Um, well, I don't, there's no transition for this. So, um, how do you feel about adding U.S. representatives? So, you know what I mean yeah. when I say that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. actually, you did a video. Um, 
I think it was it the one where you talked about constitutional amendments that you would add, or was it a different? Oh, that's video? right, and you reacted to it. Yes, and that was one of the one of the few that I agreed with. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I mean, how long have we had four hundred and thirty-five? How long's it been? Like hundred years. Yeah, hundred years. Yeah. Nineteen twenty-nine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the number of people represented by each one is going on a million people now, and it was nowhere near that a hundred years ago. Um, yeah. I, I think more and more representatives are becoming just two year senators. when you think about it that way, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the number of people they represent and the way they're supposed to do that job, I'd be a hundred percent for that. Yeah. That's awesome. We'll run on the unity ticket. Well, that will be our platform there you go. Our issue. We can raise awareness about now. Uh, but how would it look like, like what sh should it be? I know that there, it would have to be a gradual thing, but mm -hmm. what, what, do you think should be the ideal number? Cause that's one, one thing I'm kind of flexible on. I'm open to a uh, suggestion. <laughs> Obviously there's the logistical component to it, but I, you know, I look at like the UK, first of all, if you ever go to Congress and you actually go in there and watch while they're in session, yeah, ninety percent of them aren't in there anyway. Right. They come and go the whole time. I was there with my daughter and we saw Chuck Schumer speaking in the Senate. I think oh. I counted four senators in there while he was speaking. Yeah. They, it's more they put for on a performance for the yeah, camera. It, it's for the theme. camera. So the, the logistical aspect of fitting them all in there is probably less of an issue. Even with voting, they come and go as they during voting. They're coming in and out. Yeah. Uh, and in the UK, they can't fit nowhere near all their members of parliament at one time in parliament. Um, I'd be total. I'd be okay, honestly, with doubling it. I, I'm sure we wouldn't go that big. But I'd be okay with that, and that would probably make it as simple as possible. You just split all the districts in half. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have that many more issues with gerrymandering to deal with. But I think maybe I, argue, I was gonna say I argue it actually it would make it harder for to gerrymander because, yeah. like you know, people are are so spread out as far as where they live. Even even within cities, you have variation um, that you'd have to. It'd be more difficult to get creative with how you draw them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I always say double as well, because then, you know, you, you, you think about like a state like Alaska, mm. where you have one representative for that giant state. I know that not many people live there. I get it. But, uh, it's still incredible to me. That, I mean, Montana finally got a second mm -hmm. one and they have 1.2 million people or something. I don't think any, like one person representing a million people is, uh, pretty crazy. And, uh, also, what you mentioned with where they have offices, most of their offices aren't even in the Capitol. Most people don't realize their offices are across the street, yep. uh, the Cannon Building. That's where a lot of times they're interviewed on these news outlets. That's where they are. They go under the tunnel to go vote yep. uh, across the street. But so, yeah, um, it's some of these districts, even in Ohio, Ohio is a pretty populous state and we're, we're pretty small in terms of size. Uh, yeah. My the district I live in until last year with the redistricting, my district stretched from where I live. I'm right on the border of two districts, mm -hmm. stretched all the way down to Portsmouth, Ohio, which is a four and a half hour drive from here. That was one district that's, uh, that Bill yeah, Johnson ridiculous. represented. Marietta, Ohio is in the middle of it, and that's two hours away. He had to go two hours north and two hours south southwest to cover his district. Oh, uh, four hours one. How can you possibly? represent an area that size with that many different like the northern part of his district is one thing the southern parts very much appalachia it's two different worlds. Oh, yeah. yeah so well it's like alaska they'd be they probably have two districts where one would be southeastern um alaska in mm -hmm. the uh, uh the peninsula and then then the other one would be like fairbanks and everything where yeah. else like i don't know <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Glad you agree though. I'm, we're yeah. on, I'm glad you're on board with that. <laughs> we, we agree on that one. We'll get to the one we don't agree on in a little bit, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so this one goes back to the, um, logistics of YouTube. Cause I know you are now, this is your job, right? I mean, you're not teaching anymore full time. Uh, what right. were the, the things that you had when you made that decision? what were some of the factors that you had to weigh in, in making this full-time? Like what ultimately led you to, to do this full-time? <laughs> well, I mean, after you already started the channel and it had been successful, 
Like, what were the pros and cons? Yeah, the the I guess the stability of a teaching gig, uh, not just the you know you're guaranteed a paycheck every mm-hmm. month, um, but also the benefit, the so-called benefits. Um, I didn't do air quotes that time. Sorry, you drank, <laughs> enough, you drank enough eggnog. Uh, but yeah, I had health insurance that was meh. Um, the retirement package. Every teacher has some kind of retirement package. Um, I did the math though, and it was kind of overrated. I realized that if I had my own insurance, like in the marketplace, it wouldn't be that much more expensive mm. but even for my entire family. Uh, at the time, my my wife, Mrs. Beats, who who wasn't in the chat earlier, uh, shout out to her if she's still here, but she, she helps me out a lot now, but back then she was still working for the state of Kansas and um, and so like, uh, that was kind of the safety net. <laughs> so this is not only one job, but two that you guys don't have anymore. That you Exactly. Have yeah. yeah, no, she took the leap yeah. um, a year after I did, but yeah, I, I, I'll never forget doing the math initially. It was just like, Whoa, like I had a really good month and it was actually during the pandemic 2020, mm-hmm. uh, because things really escalated that year kind of beyond my wildest imagination. And I was like, I remember walking around thinking like I had just won the lottery or something. Cause it was like, cause I never, I always just assumed it would be a, a side hustle. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, like, Oh, I don't have to coach anymore. Cause every teacher has a second or third job. Um, and so that was a kind of just, I just remember I was like walking on sunshine and um, but the, yeah, it was scary. So you said the, the, the kind of weighing the pros and cons. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing is once I did go full time, the channel actually uh, kind of, at first plateaued and then views went down and I was like, holy crap. I was questioning everything. Like, what have I done? Because, you know, YouTube, uh, just content creation in general is very, it's like a roller coaster. You just can't predict it. Algorithms are, we think we've got them pinned down, but then they <laughs> change up the algorithms again. When I say we they really don't have a clue, nobody has a clue. Like a lot of times the people, even the, uh, the programmers, the ones who actually set up the, the algorithms, they don't even, they yeah. can't even predict what they're going to do. Cause I talked to some of those, those folks that work <laughs> uh, on that team of the search and discovery team at YouTube. It was very insightful. And they, a lot of times they said, the the metaphor that I always use is like, like they, um, it's like giving birth to some, to, you know, to a child, but then you set them off into the world and you don't know what's going to happen mm-hmm. when they're there. Um, and so that's also, you remember all the negative stuff a few years ago, how like all these people were like be- becoming radicalized on YouTube and a lot of them were beginning believing in like stuff like flat earth and mm-hmm. Uh, that was one of those unintended consequences. They had no idea that would happen. And so they had to go back to the drawing board. And so I think YouTube at least is more cognizant more than any other platform, especially more than TikTok these days. But as far as like realizing that, hey, we have millions of people on this platform. They are small business owners who, if we, every decision we make in terms of how we adjust algorithms could end up like making it so that they lose their job it's kind of crazy, but it's yeah. also like, I shouldn't just have to rely on one, one platform, but I still do, you know, like yeah. what if YouTube were to stop, <laughs> you know, I mean, my what, Patreon, if, what if they got sold? Patreon. Like, yeah. All Patreon's huge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause you, like, I, I don't know about you, but I, uh, it's, we, we are not, thankfully we're frugal people. We don't live extravagant lives. And so we can just, we just pretend like we're still, I'm still teaching basically put that money aside in yeah. case people stop watching my videos. I don't know if this has been your experience, but it's certainly been mine. I'm at probably this week. I'll hit 400,000 subscribers. Congrats. My views. Thank you. Uh, my views, my average views and watch time have really not increased all that much since I was at like a hundred, 150,000 subscribers, which is really, really strange. You know, I mean, I, I'll have, bigger spikes than I used to. So there's more potential yeah. there, I think. But the day to day honestly hasn't changed all that much with the growth. Like I'm not, it's not like now that I have more than double the subscribers, I'm getting double the views and making double the money. It hasn't grown like that. So yeah. it's been kind of an interesting thing. Cause I think a lot of people subscribe 
and then they find something else they get interested in. They're still subscribed to you, but maybe they're not watching as much and oh, maybe totally. they'll come back to it later. And, you know, people we're, we're fickle when it comes to our interests, we'll get interested in something and watch all their videos and then move on to something else. And then six months later, Oh yeah, I forgot about that person. And then they'll come back to it. So that's exactly how it is. And that's kind of scary too. I mean, cause mm -hmm. you want to support them consistently but also we change as viewers like True. what the channels i watched uh, five years ago are not what i watched today yep. and even though i might still be subscribed to them <laughs> yeah it's crazy uh yeah so if you're an aspiring youtuber by the way um i hope that you found any of that benefit if you ever have any questions yeah uh, yep. email us we, we'll probably because we love talking about this stuff <laughs> okay uh your turn i think Mm, my turn. No, it's your turn. Yeah. My turn. We are on question nine. Um, before we do that, somebody says we need to do another uh, president tier list. Um, I I don't know. It I don't know how much would have changed since the last one we did though. I was gonna say I haven't really been Warren Harding would maybe go up for me. Oh yeah. Um that's about it though. Most of the other ones are the same. I Nixon, maybe, maybe mm. we were talking about him earlier, maybe going up a little bit. My mother-in-law uh, went to Warren G. Harding High School. Oh, that's it's right. A, I think you, you told well, it's him Warren, that. Ohio, but they they <laughs> did a play on the name of the city and made it Warren Harding High School. Clever lads, I love it. Um. Oh, this I, I missed this one. My favorite ten questions yet. Thanks to you, and you haven't reacted to the final yeah i do i do need to do that last one and i actually oh, Matt okay. sent me a couple extra of those christian denomination charts to give away when i do that last episode so yeah uh, i need to get on that you know i helped him with uh revamping the american history chart which i have oh, did you? uh the old one up there and we haven't got around to like getting it out there but uh because that one's out of date actually by this point still has obama as the last president matt's a good guy i like him Oh yeah. Uh, what what is more likely to happen in our lifetime? A blue Oklahoma or a red California? Mm. Lifetime. Both. Blue Oklahoma. <laughs> Just my yeah, guy. Blue Oklahoma. Oh, yeah, I would agree with you, and the reason why is because California was red as recent as the nineties. That's true. So it's probably not due anytime soon, but yeah, I Oklahoma's been red since at least I would say the seventies. I haven't yeah, looked at yeah. it lately, but all right. Uh, so we'll save the electoral college question okay. for last. Um, but then th that leaves this other really serious question um, because, and we talked. I should have br brought this up earlier, but just you know. I don't watch the news much anymore either. And for the reason of, I think it just causes a lot of despair and you're like psychologically kind of <laughs> day to day. Uh, and plus, you know, we're, we're already like submersed into history anyway. And a lot of times that means we're reading and watching about wars and horrible stuff. Um, the G word. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say again, I'm, I'm trying not to say these words that get me age restricted. Uh, so anyway, I, the question I, I think that is is big that we are, especially with Israel, Palestine right now, is um, how will the cycle of violence actually end? Because what we're seeing right now is like, OK, it's like it's just a rerun. You know, it's like we people who study history, we kind of we're not too surprised by what's going on mm -hmm. right now in his, uh, with, with uh, um, Israel and Palestine. But. How do you think this cycle of violence will actually end or will it, will it not? <laughs> My gut would say it won't. Um, unfortunately, if history is any indication, the only way that anything I think will change, and I, I'm not just talking about, and, and please, I, I got to qualify what I'm about to say. I am not advocating for what I'm about to say. I think the only way it ends is with the total defeat of one side or the other to the point where you, I mean, throughout history, if you think about it, the way people kept violence from happening was to totally wipe out the side 
that was not in power. You know, if you're looking at the Wars of the Roses, for example, in England, it was a dynastic conflict that went on for a couple of generations. And the way it stopped was that one side ran out of people who could claim the throne because they all died. Or fled. Or fled and, and <laughs> yeah. became irrelevant in, in some yeah. way. So I, part of me, so for example, I'm wondering if that's not Israel's view right now, for example, oh, how they're dealing with that's this. That's totally their view. We've got to wipe this out so this doesn't keep happening. I'm not saying that's how it should be. I'm saying I think they're looking through history and saying this is typically how these things come to an end. Or one side has a dramatic change in policy of some kind, <laughs> which I don't see happening in that particular instance. Maybe more likely to happen with Russia and Ukraine is that if you somehow had a, a change in leadership, say with Russia, a, a dramatic change in leadership, either from death or an election or something, that there could be a radical change in policy. But I feel like those are probably the only two ways. Otherwise, you're just going to keep going on. And, I, and unfortunately, I think it'll probably just keep going on. Yeah, that's... Uh, I don't know. What do you think? I, I don't know. Um, I think one thing that I am very sensitive to is um, blowback. Um, mm -hmm. It's a term the CIA coined back, back in like probably the 1950s or whatever. And I, I learned a lot when I was younger about all these interventions that the uh, the CIA was involved with and the the deep state the so-called deep state of the united mm -hmm. states was you know they were uh causing directly often sometimes indirect indirectly but they were causing coups they were overthrowing governments and in, in their place they were installing dictators sometimes ruthless horrible dictators iran and, for example yeah Iran, yeah, that's like the most famous example at this point now. But yeah, especially in Latin America. That then became big problems for us later on. Yeah. Yes. You look at Al-Qaeda, how they got started. Yep. Um, I mean, Al-Qaeda used to be aided by the United States government. We get a lot of their weapons they got from yep. us. The training they got from we We're us. training them to fight the Soviets. Yep. And then exactly. they turn around and use those same weapons on us. Yep. Uh, but also the radicalization that happens when you intervene around the world, when you're trying to like put out fires around the world, mm. there's always unintended consequences. And so I feel yeah. like we, anytime violence is actually pursued, um, you know, you're taking the risk of you're going to kill innocent people. It's almost inevitable. Uh, drone warfare. Some estimates say that 90% of all drone targets in the last 10 years, uh, since drone warfare has escalated under Obama, uh, first with Bush under Obama, uh, Trump, and now Biden, although Biden is, doesn't do it as much surprisingly, but still 90% of those targets are actually civilians, we find out. They're not suspected terrorists. And so we're just like, okay, the people who survive, they lose loved ones who are not they're not terrorists that they're, they're losing their fathers, their mothers, their brothers, mm -hmm. sisters. They are now radicalized Yeah, and they're going to grow up and be, and they're going to be a terrorist as well. And this cycle will just continue. And I, th I do think it takes courage from, uh, there has to be a leader of some sort who has the courage to do the right thing. And mm -hmm. we haven't seen that. We, we, it's still so much just nationalism and geo. And it, it, we need compromise. And right now, like for Israel and Gaza, for example, both sides, it, it, it feels like both sides are basically all or nothing. And nobody's willing to say, we yeah. can't possibly have everything we want. We have to compromise. We can't, we can't have it both ways. If we, if we continue to try and do what we're doing, we're going to keep getting what we're getting. And we've tried. I mean, you've had Camp David Accords and you've had different things over the years that have kind of kind of like with the American civil war, kicked the can down the road for a generation yeah. or so, but yeah. it just came back because we never really dealt with the underlying issues. Well, and I was on a stream. I don't know if you know who destiny is. He's a political yes. streamer. Yeah. Oh yeah. He was, I was on with him uh, recently and you know, he's a firm like Israel all the way they can do. No, it's just war. It's just mm -hmm. war, you know? And I'm always, I'm like, Hey, um, what about after the war is over? Like, and he brought up Germany. He's like, hey, remember uh, 
the Allies defeated the Nazis. And look at Germany today. Germany is a success story. Look at um, Imperial Japan was defeated. Japan today is a success story. Um, I just don't see that happening. It's a different, it's a totally yeah. different, you've got different okay. religions, different. I'm glad you agree with me on that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not at all the same thing. Yeah. And I think that, um, yeah, we, the religion aspect is, it's not all, but it's, it's a big no, yeah. part of it. And I, I do think that they have to get past the religious part of it. Like you, like you were saying earlier, like you rooming with the, the Muslim who you didn't know, and you guys ended up getting, I think you need to have a situation where the, this religion is not a barrier and they just mm -hmm. see each other as like, Oh, we're just neighbors, you know? And to, Hey, and unfortunately, and it's not, I don't want to just pick one side, but a lot of these kids, like you said, number one are radicalized because, and on both sides, they have both, both sides have grown up from childhood being told that the other side is your enemy. Right. And, and that's all they've ever heard. Yes. So without even encountering anybody from the other side, they already, you're already the enemy, even though that person has never personally done anything to, to me, you're the enemy because I've been told my whole life you're my enemy. And so that just fosters more of that. And it's been going on for almost 80 years now over there. And a lot of people don't realize a lot of there's, there are in Israel uh, for decades, there have been Muslims li living peacefully, mm -hmm. going side by side with uh, Jews going to the same schools together, becoming yep. friends together yep. in Israel. Yep. That's something that's not brought up enough, I think. And I'm, people are like, oh, you can never have a one state solution there. I'm like, well, they kind of already do. And yeah. Israel itself, like, but it is sad. Get, however you look at it, whatever side you fall on it, get, the story of Gaza is a tragedy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. These poor people, like. And whoever just, you blame for it and whoever's at fault doesn't matter if they're all there are still lots of innocent people who are suffering because of exactly it, regardless we, of who's at fault we should just stop there <laughs> like yeah try to try to save lives it's like anyway that's what that's what i was saying i i think we do ourselves a disservice when we force everyone to take a side you're either for palestine or you're for israel and if you're if you speak in any way favorably about one side or sympathetic to one side that automatically means you hate the other side <laughs> and it's possible yeah. to be on the side of justice and life and recognize that both Israel and the Palestinians and the people in Gaza, you know, have a right to expect fairness and justice and to be able to live, whatever that looks like. So well put. Yes. All right. So, uh... Do you have a do you have a question that's related to that? Probably not. Um, <laughs> no, but well, this could kind of go to that, I guess. If you could make a video about a topic that you've never covered, and you didn't have to worry about the backlash being demonetized or age restricted in any way, what topic would you cover? Oh, I've, I actually have been asked this before in the, in the episode. I don't remember who asked mm -hmm. me that though. I think it might have been Science Asylum, maybe. I don't know, but yeah. Um, I, I I mentioned the the Bud Dwyer um, thing. Oh, the Pennsylvania, the guy from Pennsylvania that that on live shot TV. himself on TV. Yeah. yeah, I guess I shouldn't have said it. <clears throat> well, at this yeah. point, yeah. <laughs> um, that was the th the thing I answered at the time, just because it was I, it was on my list for years and years and years, and I, that was why. I, I, mm. But it's just such a a crazy thing, and and also like, I think we don't talk enough about suicide i i released a video mm. about nirvana um in, on my other channel and uh i know suicide is an issue very near and dear to your heart as well and so i mentioned kurt cobain you know committed suicide and uh, that that video got age restricted because I, mm. I said i just said that he was you know and um you know i just think it's something we need to talk about more <laughs> uh because you know i lost a, a good friend to it and um, and the same, same thing with, um, uh, addiction of any, mm -hmm. any kind, you know, it's like, these are, um, this is mental illness. This is like, a, it's a, it's not like it is a disease yeah. that people are suffering from. And I think, uh, we don't really say this enough, but ultimately YouTube is about making money <laughs> about pleasing the advertisers. And so when they say, oh, we're worried about kids seeing this stuff now. No, you're just you're worried about 
displeasing the advertisers yeah. is what you are. Yeah. And so I think that um, these conversations need to be had at YouTube and other, all platforms for that matter mm -hmm. saying these, we need to talk about this stuff um, because there are too many, especially younger people that are suffering from depression and they can't even get out of bed and uh, they don't know where to, we can't even talk about it on YouTube without yeah. getting age restricted. <laughs> so stuff like that's, that's the stuff I've been I'm like, I want to make videos about that. Yeah. And I, I have, I haven't done anything on it in a while, but I have my VTH extra channel where I kind of deal with some of those kinds of topics talked about <laughs> what happened at, um, at Uvalde when that happened, I kind of gave my thoughts on that. Something I probably <laughs> wouldn't do on my main channel. Um, and obviously you get all kinds of comments in that and, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I am now the exact age my great grandfather was when he took his own life, um, hung himself on Christmas morning. Oh, um, my grandfather was my father's father's father. Um, uh, my grandfather found him as a teenager and, uh, um, so yeah, and I've obviously I've had friends, um, classmates and, and things like that. And, and being in, in youth ministry for years dealt with a lot of that and being with Rachel's challenge, I've dealt with that. And yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. I think our world's getting better at talking about that stuff because more prominent people are talking about it. Prince William over the UK talks a lot about mental health. Yeah. Uh, Prince Harry obviously does. Um, a lot of people do, and I think that helps destigmatize it a little bit. I mean, my wife's a school counselor now, so she obviously deals with a lot of that stuff. And um, yeah, uh, I, I agree a hundred percent. I think that's something we need to talk more about. Yeah, and it's good to see it more on like TV shows and stuff. Like I know Ted Lasso. Um, mm, great show. Yeah, love oh, Ted Lasso. We were in London. I went to this where they filmed some of the. Oh, you went to Richmond. Yeah, we went to. The I wanted road. to go there. I haven't been there yet. Very cool, uh, but yeah, the it's one of my favorite shows, and uh, it the fact that he just um, just made it okay to talk about um, panic attacks. Like, no, this is something that's actually fairly common, and yeah. anxiety. Like, so many people are dealing with anxiety. I think it might be like more than ever, like in terms of percentage of the population, mm -hmm. just because of the modern world, of, like yeah. the world we're living in for a lot of the issues we already talked about tonight. Uh <laughs> really strange thing I connected with with Ted Lasso was that he he had this very specific physical thing he did when he would start to have a panic attack where he would go like that with his hands. Oh yeah. And I don't get a lot of anxiety anymore. I I'm pretty even keeled most of the time, but even like in my 30s when I would start to deal with anxiety, that was my outlet for that. Like it would it would manifest hmm. itself in my hands. I would do exactly that. I would like kind of go like that with my hands and and kind of do it in such a way that people didn't see it and so when i saw that i was like oh my gosh i know exactly what that specific thing feels like it's interesting wow yeah that's crazy yeah it's something that's more common than people i don't i just we just need to talk about it <laughs> yeah. and i love that ted lasso did it in such a way that didn't make it cheesy like i mean they, it was oh, a comedy yeah. show but they worked it in in such a way that felt real. And, and I think people could relate to, uh, you know, him talking about losing his dad. And it sounds like, for, I think if I remember right, it was, it was suicide that he lost his dad to um, in that show. And, um, you know, right about the time that they were covering that topic, I had lost my grandfather, who was really my dad. And uh, so in a weird way, seeing him process that helped me process my own grief and losing my mm. dad. Yeah. That's, isn't it crazy how a lot of times the, we should be seeing a therapist or something, mm -hmm. but these TV shows are taking the place of a therapist. <laughs> we're just like, we're like, I find myself crying. Like, uh, even like last night I was like crying in a Christmas movie and my daughter was sort of like, what the heck is wrong with you? And I'm realizing it. I'm like, Oh, this is like about, Oh, I'm thinking yeah. about the relationship that I have with this family member. <laughs> mm. Yeah, deep stuff. This has been deep. All right. <laughs> this. Uh, oh wow, we got some. Okay, thank you all. Uh, Henry Henry Ford, a hero or a villain in history? Yes. I was gonna say clearly both. Both. Uh, <laughs> it's not black or white. He has some good things. He was also. Flaming anti-Semite certainly supported fascism in Europe. Uh, was not a good father. Um, 
but oh, I don't know. Some really great things. I don't know much about his uh, home life. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He uh, when his he, his his only son took over the company, he basically like bullied his son the whole time he was running the company and tried to interfere. And a lot of people argue that he drove his son into an early grave because his son died in his forties from cancer. And um, wow. Yeah. So yeah, he not a, not a good dad from everything I've read. Goodness. We rarely get to see you here. Uh, one of the folks that's on uh, my Twitch stream regularly, I think, because they mentioned Vermin Supreme, who's running for president again. Uh, just basically, do you know who Vermin Supreme is? No. Oh, my gosh. He's the guy who puts the boot on his head and says. Oh, he's OK. I didn't know that's run. what he was called, but I've, I know. Yeah. Who, uh, yeah. He's run for president like every like the, the last five elections. And now he's running again. Uh, would you guys be interested in exploring topics of USA foreign policy before World War I, like Barbary Wars, uh, Japan, Boxer Wars, Siam, Paraguay? I have a video about the uh, Barbary Wars already. Mm. So um, I know that Cynical Historian has a few videos about, like he has a video about the Boxer Rebellion. Mm. Yeah, um, a lot of people don't realize that we were involved in a lot of those things. Uh, you know, yeah. like in the years leading up to World War One, people think, well, we just suddenly joined World War One in 1917. Well, no, we were sending troops to Mexico. We had troops in Haiti and China. I mean, we were doing a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. Especially Latin America. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole Monroe Doctrine thing. Yep. Uh, Paraguay, there's a good video by Emperor Tiger Star again about yep. uh, why Rutherford Hayes is so admired down there. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's right. And, um, you know, uh, Ulysses Grant, when he was president, had a deal in place to purchase the Dominican Republic and make it part of the United right. States. But the Senate wouldn't ratify it. Um, yep. He had everything ready to go with that one. Was it was the Dominican Republic? Wasn't it the entire island, though? Or was it might have been the whole island. Yeah. Central yeah. Domingo, yeah. That's Santo great. Domingo. Yeah. Yeah, he, it was. And uh, it was. Um, oh, who's the the radical Republican that basically derailed the whole thing. Um, Sumner, I think it was Charles oh, Sumner no that got in the way of that. <laughs> Same oh. guy that got beaten on the floor of the Senate. Yep. That's right. I got, had my picture taken next to his statue when I was in Boston. There's a giant statue of him. That's, uh, uh, it's what part of town is it? I love Bo Boston's my favorite big city that, to visit, by the way, in the United States. Oh man! You ever eaten at Cheers? Uh, I we I would have I, I went there. I didn't go inside. Yeah. The food was yeah. actually pretty good. We we had dinner. We had lunch there when I was there with my family a couple years ago. Did everybody know your name? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the people are like too young to remember what that even is. Yeah, I was gonna say no one gets the joke other than you. Okay, uh, malafunction. Uh, I always appreciate your uh, pictures on that you share with me on Twitter, uh, they from Hawaii and oh, beautiful. Nice. They live in paradise. Anyway, it takes experience to division in your own life to understand how painful division truly mm -hmm. can be. Well said. And thank you for the super chat. And then last one here, Joshua, just wanted to say, keep going to my two favorites and most watched YouTubers. Love you guys. Well, thank Appreciate you. Joshua. That, Joshua. Thank you. What an honor. That's awesome. All right. So yeah, we're up to the last question. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I, don't, I think we lost our uh, moderators earlier, but for the so uh, I literally wrote this out. Like I said, um, I don't know if you can see. Oh. I said I hate debates, but electoral college. <laughs> but seriously, no, I don't want to like. Obviously, I I want to have a discussion mm -hmm. about it because I'm not a I'm not good at debating, and b I feel like debates are just like. It's pure rhetoric anyway. Mm -hmm. You don't really, the person that wins the debate, a lot of times is just like, you know, they sound good. <laughs> they, they don't not, not, They don't necessarily have the substance. But yeah, like, um, I, this is another thing that I oh, put on my to switch to 10th question. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. Get, keep me in line here. So my, when I taught government, I told my, the students, I uh, actually showed them my, my first electoral college video, like I said, and then I said, here's why I don't like the electoral college. This is my opinion. Mm -hmm. And then their assignment was to change my mind. And I did this for several semesters and, you know, inevitably they did, I did kind of move towards the, the fence as, as well. Um, 
mainly is the thing that I, I think was the best compromise that I can, I want to hear what your thoughts on this mm -hmm. is as a country, we just do what Maine and Nebraska already do. They split up their electoral votes. And so it's by district. And so like in Nebraska in 2020, you had the first district, um, or maybe it was the, the third, I get them mixed up, but the Omaha district in Nebraska that voted uh, for Biden. And then the mm -hmm. other two districts voted for Trump and it divided it up and it wasn't perfect. And it would have had a, a lot of times you'd probably have the similar results, but at least it's more democratic and it's like a, so what are your thoughts on that? I actually, I could support that. I could okay. support that idea. Honestly, because basically at that point, it's really similar to the parliamentary system, say in the UK, yeah. where they're electing a member of parliament and then whatever party has the most seats in parliament, their leader becomes the prime minister. Okay. Um, and then if we increase the districts, then it would be even... Right. Still be okay I could that. actually support that idea uh, okay. if it was something like that. My, my, my typical way of completely avoiding even debating the topic on the Electoral College is it's not going anywhere, so it's a waste of time to debate it because to, oh, to, yeah. to get rid of the Electoral College would require a constitutional amendment that right. would have to be voted on by the very states that would be giving up power by doing that. I can't right. see the Montanas and South Dakotas and Nebraskas of the world voting to eliminate the Electoral College. It would have to be at a later date, a much later date. True. Under As things exist now, it wouldn't happen. Yeah. And I know that a lot of people will point to the... I forget the, the title of it, but the thing that all the states are signing on with, the interstate uh, electoral... The this, compact. The interstate compact. compact. Yeah. But my only statement about that would be the Supreme Court, especially the current Supreme Court, would shoot that down so fast, it would never go anywhere. The minute it took effect, they would point to the clause in the Constitution that says that states can't make agreements like that without consent of Congress, and they would throw it out. Are you talking about, okay, which clause is that? It's the one, uh, uh, is it the interstate compact clause in the Constitution that states can't make agreements with each other okay. without, yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. And and because it's an agreement that requires all of those states, it's something that they're all signing on to, and it only takes effect when a certain number of states agree to it. I mean, I guess yeah. you could have Congress pass it if you had enough support, say, from the Democrats in Congress. I was going to say, that's what I was going to bring up. I was like, yeah. well, Congress could step in and say, could. That was okay, like this is an, uh, an exception. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah. I, still, I don't see that changing. And unfortunately, by extension, because of the power of the Electoral College and how close a lot of our elections have been, I also don't see us adding any new states anytime soon for the same reason. Yeah, there would have to be demographic shifts. There would yeah, have to be, it, just um, like with the American Civil War, that all the debates that went on about adding new states that required compromises because of the balance of power issue, you would have those same arguments today. Um, Republicans would oppose adding Puerto Rico or D.C., for example, because they'd almost certainly be two new Democratic senators, and it would shift mm -hmm. the balance of power in the Senate that much more. And um, Or like some of the places where there's a movement to secede from california for example or oregon where they're they've got that movement same thing would happen there because that's potentially adding two new republican senators and so all the democrats would oppose that and everything's about the balance of power compromise yeah just like they did with the missouri compromise. maybe add, add both yeah that would be the only yeah. way i would see that working right now but even then yeah you i think there's just so much um division within congress that so i guess something an idea that um just to think about, uh, you mentioned that right after the Civil War, actually even during the Civil War, because you know when the Confederacy formed and all those members of Congress were gone, mm -hmm. they got a lot done. Yeah, the members of Congress who were still there—it's kind of crazy. Like even the few Democrats who who remained, a lot of them were like, "Oh yeah, let's uh, let's build the Transcontinental Railroad uh, Homestead Act. Yeah, let's do mm -hmm. it. You know, they're just let's uh, let's pr just print, let the president uh, print money." You know, that's when they just start printing money. Like, holy, yep. it's a big freaking deal. 
And then after the, the Civil War, you had the Reconstruction uh, Amendments. Boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. uh, the 14th Amendment, the most consequential amendment in American history other than the Bill of Rights. Like, holy crap. And yeah. But then, okay, reality started to set back in by the 1870s. And then, and, but then, so you get these waves in history where there's mm -hmm. all like progress at once. Uh, the next time it happened, 1890s to uh, yep. World War One, progressive era. Mm -hmm. So what happened then, you had like, all of a sudden, like the Republican Party and Democratic Party were just like realizing, oh, we better like pay attention to the people because there's this whole separate movement going on, mm -hmm. like this populism. And so they all kind of co-opted it. And then next thing you know, you can't really tell that much difference between Republicans and Democrats because like a lot of Woodrow Wilson's policies were the same as uh, Taft or, or Roosevelt. Yep. yep. And, and so you had another series of amendments passed. Uh, and then the next time that happens is uh, FDR, where you didn't get amendments passed so much, but you got tons of important legislation. Yeah. Um, but the difference with FDR was people were so um, against, like Hoover had screwed up so bad. Like one guy had just like- Yeah, it was a big thing. pendulum swing oh, in the other direction. Yeah, it was so lopsided. Yeah. So- um, the, and then the 60s, I would say, is another time that happened where you yeah. saw, like, maybe if JFK wouldn't have been assassinated, like, you wouldn't have seen it as much, but Goldwater didn't help. And 64, you got, like, LBJ's like, ah, ah, ah. Yeah. and you had that few, like, that three years in the 60s where boom, 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 more amendments passed, huge legislation. What was the last amendment? Early 70s? Was that our last amendment? 1992, but that was, like, oh, so that's, yeah. That was a bipartisan thing. Yeah. But even as late as the 90s, though, we the Congress was fairly bipartisan. And even like the Reagan Revolution yeah. was still like in the 80s, you had like, okay. Yeah, Tip O'Neill worked great with Reagan on a lot of things. I was going to yeah. say, Reagan, yeah. people forget that Reagan was popular uh, not just with people that leaned to the right. He he, he brought people from the left over yeah, to Yeah, Reagan him. Democrats. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there wasn't necessarily huge legislation that passed. It was more like just a, I, I would say, more of a cultural shift. Mm -hmm. um, we shifted to the right as a country, but since then we haven't had. We are over. What I, I, yeah. I keep going on. We are overdue for a progress, a new progressive era. I was talking to. I have a friend, Joe, who uh, is a foreign policy advisor in the UK for Parliament. Um, and in fact, cool story. I don't know how much you follow this stuff, but. The day the queen died, earlier that day, parliament was in session and there was this thing that went all over the news where they were passing a note around, like the prime minister and everybody, and they were reading a note and that was how they found out the queen was really ill. Joe wrote that note. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was the one that wrote that note that got passed in there. Holy and crap. He goes to 10 Downing Street and, and like advises the prime ministers and stuff like that. I was talking to him about this and he's, he's part of the Tory party. He's conservative. Uh, mm -hmm. And he said that in the UK, their default is conservative. But whenever they have the liberals sweep into power, a whole bunch of stuff changes all at once. And yeah. then they default back to conservative and go a generation or so. And then a liberal comes in, a bunch of changes happens, and then they go back to conservative again. Um, and it doesn't quite happen here, but we have our what we call our our party um, party systems where there's yeah. radical shifts in the party. And I think we're undergoing one right now. Yes. A lot of it because of Trump, but all the byproducts of Trump as well. I think 10, 15, 20 years from now, the parties are going to look completely different than they did 10 years ago. Uh, you can see a lot of that happening. We're in the middle of it still, so we can't really see it as much, but we'll look back on it and the parties are going to look completely different. 10 yeah. years from now than they did 10 years ago, for sure. It's so weird because there are Republicans that they call someone like Liz Cheney a rhino. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why is because she's, she's not a, a Trump. Right, because, yeah. Man. And but really, she's not. And, and even She's the traditional Republican. Yeah. George W. <laughs> Bush would be a rhino to those folks. Exactly. It's so crazy because 20 years ago, they would be the rhinos. And mm -hmm. so that, that, to me, is a sign that the Republican Party has dramatically changed. But the other thing that people don't like to realize, and you don't have to you don't have to give Trump credit for this. He just kind of, he's more of a symptom than a cause. Um, but I think there is tr the true element of populism that's, mm -hmm. that's a strong force in the Republican Party. I would argue it goes back all the way to Pat Buchanan in the 90s yeah. and continued up through uh, Ron Paul. In the, 
2008, and it's a the um, anti intervention, military inter- mm-hmm. intervention, um, sound money, fiscal sound like a uh, low. That's true. We're seeing that now. Like Republicans being against funding Ukraine, for example. Yes. 10 years ago, that never would have happened. Exactly. But now that suddenly has become the stance. And if you're not on that stance, you're not really a Republican now. Yeah. And there were plenty of people like it. That was used to be something that was more on the left. Yeah. And you yeah. do see that wing still of the Democrat side too. It's the horseshoe theory kind of is true here where, there's a lot of coalitions that could be formed if not for this, you know, culture war stuff. Yeah. In terms of like, there's plenty of Republicans right now who, for example, they want to end the drug war. Um, and mm-hmm. Democrats have been saying that for years that we are overdue for that kind of change. Um, I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see also Democrat demographic changes too with younger voters where we're going to see like a big state, probably Texas, that's going to turn blue. And once that happens, this could, this could have a chain. And so you're going to see a majority. Yeah. It's probably going to be Democrats just because I don't know though. I used to think it was going to be Republic. Like it seems like the Republican party is more in tune with their constituents than the Democratic mm-hmm. party is right now, you know, like, cause they're still going with Joe Biden and hello. Uh, <laughs> but like, but yeah, like I still think the Democratic party, if they, they kind of get their stuff in order, I do think we're going to see a shift where you're going to get stuff actually done within mm-hmm. the next 10 years. And I do think we can actually see back to what we were originally talking about, the like an amendment passed to the constitution that for actual voting reform, I mm. think it's possible. Yeah. So certainly could be. All right. Um, so my last question is a political question as well. Then <laughs> I know you've gone through and you've done how you would vote in every presidential election. Yes. If you could go back and reverse the outcome of one presidential election in his, U.S. history, which election would you change the outcome of? Ooh, what a great question. Wow. Um, a few pop out. Um, you can share more than one if you want. That's fine. There's all right. Yeah, the one that pops up is is in our lifetime, uh, the election of 2000. I think uh, I think Al Gore would, in many ways, been similar to Bush. People don't want to admit that, especially mm-hmm. Democrats. But I think, as far as um, like, I still think that the Iraq War would have happened. For example, I still think that would have happened with with him. However, um, yeah, people forget that most Democrats were in support of that when it first happened yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as far in terms of like maybe climate change, I think that would be a big one, like the environment. Um, but also like Supreme Court justices, um, I think because we've seen actually dramatic social change over the last 25 years. And I think they would have been even more escalated if you were in there um, with Supreme Court justices. But um, still, though, it was a fairly bipartisan time. People. If, I know if was, Gore gets elected, do we have Barack Obama? That's another thing. I don't know. I just, I think, because uh, yeah, if he was reelected in 2004, which is likely, because of the probably a good chance you see maybe John McCain in 2008 then. Yeah. Or somebody completely different that's not even on the radar screen. So, but that also means that the, they stay more moderate. More moderate. Yeah. Parties. True for longer um because that's the thing a lot of people the i think the biggest disappointment of the obama era was the fact that he didn't um satisfy his base like he should Mm -hmm. have the people who originally got him in there and i'm not just talking about like the general election of 2008 i'm talking about the primaries Mm -hmm. the ones who voted in primaries passionately supporting um barack obama and i was at one of those primaries uh i remember there was two rooms Actually, it was a caucus that was in Nebraska that where they actually have at two. You go to this room if you're a fan of Hillary Clinton. Go to this room if you're a fan of Obama. And he actually showed up there too, by the way. Um, and I just remember the passion that they had. I was somebody who was just there because I wanted to see what it was like. I was not really. Mm-hmm. I was more of a Ron Paul guy, actually, believe it or huh? not, back then. But yeah, um, I, can, I can actually see that. I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it was those. And I had friends that were there. They, they were so disappointed 
um, with so much of his presidency. And I think that ultimately is why we got Trump and why mm-hmm. people abandoned the Democratic Party after Bernie Sanders, you know, was their last hope. Mm-hmm. Um, and he didn't make it. So, yeah, anyway, uh, I feel like I'm boring you. <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, I, That's good. I don't know. The other election that pops in my head is uh, probably uh, the kind of like the I made a whole video about it, but 1860, you know, obviously a war started because Abraham Lincoln got elected president. Holy crap, like a whole nother country started. Um, But I think it would, again, you're just kicking it down the road. That was so inevitable to me. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. We didn't really debate that. We didn't really t- talk about the Electoral College then. No, because I agreed with you on your pro- proposal. Well, yeah, okay. But if we want, okay, but back to that, the, the one thing I do want to point out, though, is the, the biggest the biggest problem I have with the Electoral College is it's, we pretend like um, we are above democracy. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when all of us love democracy, you know, we, we go to the store and we like to choose things. We don't want things chosen for us. No, we want the power. There's nothing more satisfying than, than being able to pick something. Um, you know, we don't have arranged marriages in this country. We choose who we want to marry. We choose. Mm-hmm. We, we choose when we want to start a family. We choose our career. We choose where we go to to college. All this stuff, and and to to just kind of it it is anti democratic. And the only arguments that I think are halfway decent are like, okay, this is all we got for small states. Like, this is the only thing we have. Like, I live in a small state. Mm-hmm. I can, I can see that side. Like, you know, what if we didn't? But the last time a presidential candidate came here to campaign was, it, I don't even remember. You know, they 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 just assume that we're going to all vote for Republicans here, and it's mm-hmm. it's frustrating. I, every time I go to the, the ballot, we don't box, have that problem in Ohio. They always come here. Well, but you're <laughs> although we've been hey, very red lately. You say that, but we just we just passed the abortion amendment to our constitution. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and then I guess and legalized Kansas. marijuana. Can, yeah. Kansas. Oh yeah, we'll be the last state to do that. But Actually, Kansas, the, uh, the abortion amendment took effect three days ago. Both of those uh, did. Marijuana is legal in Ohio as of this week. So, yeah. No, you're but right. Yeah, that, we, we we are increasingly red, and that's the thing. Like I, the the county I live in, Trump is the first president, a Republican, Republican candidate to win this county in my lifetime. Wow. It's yeah. always been blue. I have lived in the bluest part of Ohio my entire life. We've to this year is the first year I've had, or this this term is the first year I've had a Republican congressman in my lifetime. Um mm-hmm. and it, yeah, because we've had Tim Ryan and his district was the one oh, that they eliminated. Yeah. Um, and he ran for Senate. So um my my wife's sister dated him in high school, by the way. Um <sighs> But uh, because he's from Niles, which is my wife's hometown. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, a lot of things have changed. Uh, Trump was the first Republican to get significant support in, in this area in my lifetime. Uh, so mm-hmm. there's definitely been a shift in that way. And I still see it. I mean, I still see Trump 2020 signs all over the place here. They, they, yeah. they never took them down. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens in this coming election. There's definitely been a shift in this area, you know, cause we're like prime rust belt Youngstown. I live eight miles from Youngstown. Youngstown had 130,000 people in 1930. It was bigger than Nashville, Tennessee. And now, now it has just under 60,000 people. It's That's lost insane. half its population in a hundred years. And it's all because of the manufacturing jobs. All the steel mills are closed. Uh, are one issue of voters. Yep, exactly. It's been the only issue for as long as I've been alive has been manufacturing and jobs. And now that people I think have finally accepted those aren't coming back, they've moved on to other things. Have they accepted it? Well, it seems I don't hear about it anymore, so I don't know. It's so funny because like both Trump and Biden promised, oh, we're going to save manufacturing jobs. Yep. Both of them they can conti- this the trend that was already in place just continued. Uh, 
I, I wish people would stop falling for politicians. Like let mm. they you know, all these false promises and the generally the people that that you know once you're in with Trump, you're never gonna get out. That's like, true. That's whereas true. Biden, a lot of people, yeah, I'm gonna support Biden because he's all for unions. I mean, mm. a lot of those guys are like ah uh, yeah, things are still not getting. So, what better. do you think is going to happen in 2024? Oh yeah, I think Biden's in trouble. I really do. Um, you know, if they just the Democratic Party just nominated somebody even younger, you, yeah, they don't yeah. even necessarily have different uh, <laughs> policies. I think they. Do I, I don't know if it will happen, but if somehow, <laughs> if enough people drop out after Iowa, and it becomes like if the Republicans can get it to a one-on-one -on -one race. With one candidate versus Trump, yeah, I think they can beat him. I think that's how he got it in the first place. Was there was like seventeen Republican candidates, and he had the strongest support of any of the seventeen, even though it was a minority. Um, but he's still getting he is well yeah. over fifty percent. But I'm wondering oh, if oh, if everybody else drops out and it becomes say Nikki Haley versus Trump, if that might change, because I truly believe and a lot can happen. Obviously, between now and then because nobody's really focusing on her that much. I think if she won the nomination, she would destroy Biden in the election. At this um, point, yeah, right I now. I just saw yeah. a poll the other day that had her up 17 points on Biden nationally in the Wall Street Journal. 17 yeah. points on the on the incumbent. Wall Street um, Journal? Wow. Yeah. And they yeah, had and that yeah. same poll had Trump up four. See, so and that's 13 the thing. points ahead of Trump. You got a guy that's going, probably going to go to prison. Yeah. Uh, people don't even care like they <laughs> honestly, I think didn't they just escalate all this? To, uh, they escalated the issue of his immunity to the Supreme Court. Uh, I think just in the news in the last couple of days, they said, yeah, that. for one. I mean, that's only yeah. one of the charges, though. He's got yeah. nine other charges. That's the thing is, is all this going to come down after he's already the nominee? And then what do you do? I think independents, most of them don't. They're called independents oftentimes because they don't really pay attention that closely. And I think when they do start paying attention and they see, oh, he's going to prison or he is in prison, I'm not going to vote for that guy. Yeah. So, but you know, he'll never lose that base support. And that's and that's the problem. He's got that 30 to 40 percent of people that he he said it. He could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody, and they'd still vote for him. And I thought he was nuts at the time. I believe it now. I really believe that now. I didn't it's, believe it four years ago or five years ago when he yeah. said it. He's eight a, years ago, I guess it was. At, at marketing, at um, the the greatest con artist of all time, in my opinion. I know I don't want to get, but yeah, like uh, it's a it doesn't it's not it's about how you communicate. Biden is not inspiring. He's no. not charismatic. He's he still stutters. He's old. He speaks very slowly. Uh, even Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, I, people were like kind of surprised I said this, but like. Voters are often superficial, like the way he talks, like he's going he, they want yeah. somebody who's like Gavin Newsom. A lot of times Gavin Newsom, um, he'll say something. He's the governor of California, for those of you who don't know. Um, he'll say something that's like, I don't think that actually is going to resonate with most voters. But how he says it, he says it so confidently. Yeah, but I think I don't think, think it matters. Like, that's true. Like, he can win over people with his rhetoric and Democratic Party needs to figure that out because otherwise it could be interesting to see. I mean, I know that there are things in place now that weren't in place, say a hundred years ago when these things were decided at the conventions, the way that they yeah. used to be. I, I know there's a lot of legal protections for the, the people who cast their votes. It would be interesting to see if there isn't some kind of movement on either side yeah. at the convention <laughs> level to try and overturn the results of the primaries. That would be crazy. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, it's not like they, they can do what they want. The political parties can do what they want. They can change the rules. They can change the rules. That's the thing. That I, it would not surprise me if they get to this summer and the landscape looks a particular way politically at that point, if one side or the other decided to change the rules to do something radical because they feel like they have no chance of winning. Oh, this person must have. Uh, thank you for the super chat. The, not just because I live in Wisconsin, either presidential candidate should have to compete in every state if they intend to be president in all of them. Well put. Yes, I obviously I agree with that. <laughs> you have a response to that? Um, the only thing I would say is I don't know, no matter what system you have, 
I don't, I can't think of a way that you could create a situ situation where that would ever happen. Anyway, no matter how you work it, it's going to come down to with the electoral college is going to be battleground states. If you went to a direct popular vote, it would be the most populous areas where they can get the most bang for their buck in terms of uh, campaigning. Uh, so I feel like either way, it's so just the battleground pick, your, pick your poison. Battleground cities, like for yeah, example, battleground cities, battleground communities, battleground regions. I mean, I most think. cities are lean left, I guess, but there are yeah. outliers like like San Antonio is probably mm -hmm. one of those. Like that would be a battleground. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I, uh, the th I, I mean, the thing is with technology too. I always bring up that you don't really even need. I, I know I said I, I was like, oh, presidential candidates never visit my home state, but. They don't have to. That's true. We, you know, we have mass media now. You don't need to see them in person to know what they stand for, to hear exactly. them, to see them. Yeah, I just, uh, I think at the when it comes down to it, um, we, the definition of a republic is it's a, you know, you elect representatives. It's in the definition. So to say that we're not a democracy, that really like, <laughs> how do you think they get the electoral votes? They vote for them. It's democratic within right. each state. Sure. Now, I, the other thing too is, you could, I guess the way you could say it is, a republic is a is a democratic form of government. Not all democratic forms of government are republics. Yeah, I, I, that that would be technically true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and but the other thing I always bring up, like borders are meaningless uh, for a lot of parts of this country, like in terms, I'm talking about state borders. Yeah. Like I live near the Missouri border. Um, the only time that border becomes meaningful is marijuana is legal over there. It's not in Kansas. So that's <laughs> otherwise, otherwise you can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like now culturally, I think like somebody in Kansas city, Kansas has way more in common with somebody in Kansas city, Missouri than they do in Dodge City, Kansas, which mm -hmm. is way out in the way. So, like, I mean, these are these lines that are our state borders. You know, you ever watch that show? How the states got their yeah. shape? Yep. There's a book too. Yeah, I mean, it's like some of us like, oh wow, um, it was maybe important at one point, but now it's just like, yeah, you might There's be little things like line. where I live. I live eight miles from the Pennsylvania line. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in Pennsylvania, you have to go to a liquor store to buy liquor. And in Ohio, I can go to the grocery store and get it. Or That's go to right. Yeah, yeah. Stuff like that. Can't do that in Pennsylvania. Little things um, like that. <laughs> little things like that. Fireworks. The be better fireworks. fireworks which we just changed our law on that stuff. But it used to be, it was legal to set them off in Pennsylvania, but it, you couldn't buy them there. But you could buy them in Ohio as long as you didn't set them off here. So everybody from Pennsylvania would come across the border to buy them in Ohio and then take them back to Pennsylvania to set them off. And they all do that on purpose. And it's same thing with the gas taxes. You know, yep. like Missouri has a lower gas tax. And you go to, in the uh, even in Europe, it's the same way. As soon as you cross the border into Luxembourg from France or Belgium, um, you immediately, the second you cross the border into Luxembourg, there's like 20 gas stations because wow. yeah, because the gas is way cheaper in Luxembourg than it is in the bordering country. So everybody goes to Luxembourg to buy their gas. Oh, this is another point that I, I think is a good way to kind of wrap things up here. There are no, I made a whole video about this, the whole yeah. idea of like separating, having another um, civil war or like, you know, splitting into two countries. It's just not possible. We have yeah. so much uh, diversity within every state. Here in Ohio, we have one Republican and one Democrat senator. And I would guarantee you if either one of them ran for reelection right now, they would win regardless <laughs> of, of who they were running against. I always say, like, if in Kansas, as long as you're at least somewhat sympathetic to pro-life, the pro-life cause, and you're a Democrat, you still have a really good chance. Because, like, what will history teachers tell students about Trump's? Okay, we we've been going three hours here, so this <laughs> is the last one. you're not surprised. We talked yeah. about this before we started. Uh, we'll wrap it up with this one. Uh, what will history teachers tell students about Trump's effect on politics and information in the future? Um, you want to go first? I don't know. Uh, I think it's hard to say right now. I think really? uh, I say this all the time. You got to give it a good 20 years before you can really fairly judge. But obviously, they're going to have to talk about it. Um, you can't ignore 
that there's been an effect. You, you might not like the impact, but he's absolutely caused a massive shift, uh, especially in the Republican Party. Uh, like mm -hmm. I said, I think he's going to be the primary catalyst for our next party system that the parties are going to look completely different. And he more than anybody else will be the, probably one of the main factors behind that. Uh, so I think if anything, if we look back, that would be the biggest long-term impact would be the complete change of the political landscape because of his candidacy. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I think uh, <coughs> I can already tell you, it's not all negative. Um, a lot of you may not like Trump at all as a person. Um, I get it, obviously, but there's been a lot of good that has come, I think. And that's mostly been, I think he's brought a lot of people who typically were not into politics into it. And uh, he's, I happen to be a fan of populism, at least, you know, populism within certain bounds because it shakes up the system. You need public figures to shake up the system. And mm -hmm. yeah, he's done that. And he's had an effect on the Democratic Party as well. Um, probably we'll see more of that. Actually, like you said, we we're just still in the early stages of that here in 2023, aren't we? Just practically <laughs> speaking, I mean, for example, who would have thought 15 years ago that a Republican nominee for president in his acceptance speech of his nomination would advocate for gay marriage? Yeah. And get applause for it. That would never have happened in the Republican Party before Trump. Uh, he single-handedly, I think, shifted a lot of people on that issue. You don't really hear it talked about that much. Most of my very conservative friends who were extremely outspoken about that issue have just accepted, all right, that's just that's that's part of who we are now, and it's not really worth arguing over it anymore. It just that's it's a non-issue anymore. Yeah. Um, so I mean things there are some if you want to look for some positives. If you consider that a positive, that certainly is one thing. I think he single-handedly dragged the Republican Party in that direction on that issue. Well, and also, I mean, like I said earlier, rhetoric is often more important than what they actually do. Yeah, sure, he didn't actually do a lot of what he said he was going to do. Like he said he was going to drain the swamp. But mm. him saying drain the swamp, that really, it, that did start a movement. Like there's so many people in both of the political party major parties that are like yes we are tired of the so-called elites of dc of the beltway mm -hmm. need some just common folks like you and i in there to uh have you know there are pe people that are in touch with and he's not the first are. candidate to run as the outsider but he took it to a, oh, an extreme yeah. a whole new level of i'm an outsider yeah, you had a uh, Andrew Jackson was probably the first one. The uh, later you had candidates like uh, William Jennings Bryan. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, oftentimes you notice it's not it's not people who are like, you know, they're usually pretty well off. Yeah, <laughs> Ross Perot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was also an outsider, but yeah. Okay, we have. All right, we got to wrap this up here. Wow, this is a fun one, though. Come on. Who would win in a 19th century style duel? Trump or Biden? <laughs> Trump would obviously win. Trump, Trump would win. He's a big guy. He would probably. Yeah. Well, I guess Biden probably... would probably just shake, it head, shake his head and go and just start walking away. I, I don't know why I said because he's a big guy. This is not a wrestling match. No, we're talking about a shooting a pistol. Yeah, I mean, I think that. I think that the age thing, I, mm. Trump only has Although Trump's not much younger than Biden, but he seems younger than Biden. <laughs> Hard to tell. That is my all time favorite. I'm, I'm working on a script for a video about my favorite random facts about uh, presidents. And my yeah. favorite fact about Biden uh, is that he was born closer to Lincoln's inauguration than to his own. Oh my gosh. He's born you, November 20th, 1942. Yeah, he's a he's a silent generation. People are yeah. like, oh, he's a boomer. No, he's older than a boomer. <laughs> but think, and here's what's crazy too about the the last three presidents before Biden: Trump, um, well, not Obama because Obama's younger, but Trump, Clinton, and Bush. Forty six. All born the same summer. Yeah, July, born, like, August, nineteen consecutive months. Yep. In nineteen forty six. Yeah, it was in, within six weeks, I think, of each yeah. other. <laughs> Yeah, I think I tweeted that out one a few years ago. I don't know. Cincinnati's Kentucky. That's not Ohio. 
Ah, it has more of a more. Their airports in Kentucky. We call it the <laughs> Kentucky Airport. Culturally, completely different from Northeast Ohio, where I live. Completely different. I've never been to Cincinnati. It, it's a it's a nice city. I like Cincinnati. It is very different than the northern part of the state, though. Mm. I, I mean, it's, it. and I tell my like my friends in Europe are blown away when when they ask me how far I live from Cincinnati, and I said, "Well, Cincinnati's still Ohio, but it takes me five hours to get there." Yeah, and in Europe, you you could drive you know from Amsterdam to Paris in five hours. So, and they think it's a long like or I, London to Edinburgh is four hours. I think that's why like crazies like us, we, yeah, we're like, oh yeah, we'll do both Scotland and England in two weeks, and and uh, the locals are like, what? You want to do all that in two weeks? <laughs> I got a friend who lives in London who's never been to Scotland in his life. Oh my gosh! Well, you know. We have to send them the video when I release it on Friday. Maybe they'll nice. convince to move or to visit. All right, we will wrap it up here. Um, I, I just uh, before we wrap it up, make sure you uh, check out vlogging through history, um, Chris's channel. It's excellent. Um, he has the uh, obviously his bread and butter is re the reaction videos, and it's a wide spectrum like of the types of video very uh, well-rounded knowledge of history um in fact i guess gotta say this on air one thing i will always remember about you is uh when we met up in denver last year and we were at that uh, that art museum thing uh what is it called mad meow i know what you're talking about it was it was different it was yeah it was a very meow. unique experience Anyway, you stepped up in this crazy room and you just started reciting the Gettysburg Address by memory. And I was like, I don't know what's going on right now, but this is amazing. I, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> off the top of his head, just, per, uh, but yeah, so much, much respect for what you that do. That was a lot of fun. We, we definitely have to get everybody together again sometime soon. Oh, I know. Yeah. I can't believe that was over a year ago. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a couple of weeks ago It was because it was November, I think, of last year. Yeah. I had just gotten back from... Belgium, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, world traveler you are. Um, but anyway, yeah. So uh, have a good time. Yeah. For going. To so I got to ask you this real quick before we go. What Any big plans for when you hit a million subscribers? Uh, be here before you know I, it? Well, if it happens, the, the only plan I have is to finally make a video comparing Mr. Beat to Mr. Beast. Nice. Uh, oh, yeah. I like same that. format of my compared series. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Breast, give me money. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. That's our one of our commonalities. Yep. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyway, I hope we get there. Thank you all for being here. Yes. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for being on this. We finally did this. I'm glad we made it happen. Uh, and again, subscribe to his channel and have a wonderful right. rest of your day, care, everybody, forever. All right, bye bye.